Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the Central European Green Finance Conference, hosted by the Central Bank of Hungary and held this year as part of the Planet Budapest Sustainability Expo and Summit. I'm Peter Linko, I will be your host for today, and it's great to see so many of you here with us, and I trust that this will be a very informative day for us all. Now, we could say that uh, this has become, or is becoming, a tradition, because this is the third time that a public conference focusing on green finance has been held here in Budapest. And Although the global pandemic is not quite behind us yet, uh, today we have a wonderful opportunity, yet again, to exchange ideas and gather experiences. This year, among the most prominent topics of discussion are the consequences of COP26 for the financial sector, natural anomalies beyond climate change, for example, biodiversity issues, and the importance of adequate ESG strategies to tackle these problems. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to invite Mr. Choba Kondrac, the Deputy Governor of the Central Bank of Hungary, to give his opening speech and to officially open the Central European Green Finance Conference. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Choba Kondrac. Ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> I warmly welcome all of you here in uh, Budapest. I'm so happy that uh, I see concrete faces, not just uh, online ones. Uh, so it means that uh, a couple of uh, uh, our guests, distinguished guests, uh, arrived. And it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a privilege to us. So thank you very much. Uh, I think it's... Uh, it's a very, very uh, important uh, topic what we would uh, discuss during this uh, conference. And uh, I hope that uh, we will meet together. We can uh, discuss a lot of uh, important things. But before we start, uh, I'm pretty sure that you checked uh, these small cannons. And uh, you are, uh, I, I'm pretty sure that you are quite interesting uh, about what is inside this. This is a uh, Petunia, it's a flower, a very, very colorful flower, what you can uh, plant and uh, maybe it could be a small uh, race that uh, next year when we will meet, uh, everybody could uh, give us a photo and uh, we will check who, uh, whose petunia is the biggest uh, and uh, where it is. But uh, uh, I would like to start uh, a couple of uh, thoughts uh, and uh, uh, mainly uh, a small presentation about uh, our green, uh, green projects, uh, where we stand, uh, where we would uh, go. So the title of my presentation is Fulfilling Ambition, Understanding uh, Climate Risks and Greening the Financial System in uh, Hungary, because uh, we would like to be uh, a pioneer within this field, uh, we would, within our uh, region, and uh, if I, we can uh, in, in, in uh, Europe also. So we are doing a lot of things, uh, and uh, we are planning to do a lot others. So in this uh, presentation, as I mentioned to you, I will cover uh, covered, uh, the sustainability de de developments. You can see uh, a lot of things what we will touch during the days. Uh, now I focus on rather the supervisory authorities uh, side and uh, the green matters related to monetary policy of the MMB will be covered by Adam Bonai, the executive director in the afternoon. So uh, if you have time, uh, don't uh, leave too early because, and you are interested in the monetary policies uh, part of uh, our green projects. So uh, to start out my presentation, I would like to quote from David Attenborough's speech in the Glasgow Climate uh, Pact Forum. You can see here what uh, he said, and in many aspects, the Magyar Nemzeti Bank is at the beginning of the 
uh, of the road of environmental sustainability, but the MMB is ready to work together with the stakeholders uh, from the financial and the non-financial sector also, as well as to tackle uh, climate change. So climate change and uh, environmental sustainability concerns are expected to have a fundamental impact on economic actors and thus uh, financial stability or financial system stability also. Hence, central banks have an eminent role in catalyzing decarbonization and other greening processes. In Europe, MMB became the first central bank to obtain a green mandate officially. The amended MMB Act makes environmental protection and sustainability an explicit responsibility for us, without prejudice, of course, the primary objective, which is obviously the price stability. Since February 2019, we has been continuously promoting and implementing new ideas as part of its uh, or our green program. Today, I would like to speak about uh, many of these stats. So let me start with uh, our latest measure, our first long-term climate uh, stress test of the banking system. Several requirements must be met for testing the climate-related soundness of a financial system. First, factors affecting global warming need to be translated into economic uh, realities. Second, Global warming affects various uh, economic actors quite differently, and so it must be done in sectoral disaggrega disaggregation. And third, two-way feedback mechanisms between nature and economic models should be incorporated in order to make different physical and transition consequences of various policies explorable. We have utilized the climate-informed economic models uh, of an independent data provider, the Cambridge Econometrics. Cambridge uh, Econometrics prepared three scenarios for us with an outlook of uh, 2050. Orderly transition, failed transition, and disorderly transition. Under the orderly transition scenario, countries that have ratified the Paris Agreement take further decarbonization steps in addition to their previous commitment. And as a result, global temperatures are expected to be less than 2 degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial industrial level by 2100. The counterparts is the failed transition scenario. The previously announced climate and energy policy measures remained in force, but beyond these, no new aspirations are articulated. In this scenario, the globe does uh, business as usual, nothing special happened, because of which uh, the global temperature surplus will rise to 3.54 degrees Celsius. The disorderly transition presents an intermediate trajectory in which the adaptation to the principles set out in the Paris Agreement will start somewhat, somewhat uh, late after 2025. So let's uh, look at the Hungarian prospects. In case of uh, the failed transition, by uh, the end of 2050, GDP levels are expected to be lower by 4.5 percentage because of the physical consequences of uh, climate change. On the contrary, in case of orderly transmission, the physical effects are significantly reduced in parallel with the lower rise in global temperature. Moreover, the Cambridge uh, Econometrics also suggests that the transition is in fact not a risk but an opportunity for the Hungarian economy since it entails GDP surplus. Overall, the combined effect of physical and transition risks is positive, which conveys the message that an orderly global transition of uh, climate-friendly operation is highly desirable for the Hungarian economy. We focus on a key variable that uh, conveys the stability of the financial system, namely, on the ratio of non-performing loans to total loans. 
the indicator is one of the core indicators of financial soundness according to IMF's classification. We have estimated the, the direct connection between sectoral economic variables and uh, sectoral NPR ratios and utilizing these models we have made conditional forecasts of NPR ratios up to 2050. As far uh, as loan repayment performance, companies of accommodation and food service, real estate uh, activities and paper and printing seems to be the most sensitive to the future path of transition. Note, however, that the underlying factors, physical risks, transitional risks and sensitivity to cycles can be quite different. A preliminary paper of our stress test outlined in the past few minutes will shortly be available on our green website. So from now, uh, everybody can uh, find it and uh, we can discuss it and uh, we can evaluate it together. So, uh, Recommendation to credit institutions, which uh, is also a new tool uh, for us. Uh, in this April, the MMB published uh, this recommendation on climate-related and environmental risks and the integration of environmental sustainability considerations into the activities of uh, credit institutions. The purpose of this recommendation uh, is uh, firstly, to enhance the bank risk management frameworks and processes to tackle rising uh, climate-related and environmental risks. Secondly, to integrate the uh, environmental sustainability considerations uh, into the business model and strategy of uh, banks. And finally, the recommendation also increases the predictability of the application of the law and facilities, the uniform application of the relevant uh, legislation. The main messages of uh, the recommendation that uh, it's formulated the supervisory uh, expectations in four areas, business model and a strategy, governance, risk management, and disclosure. As stated in the recommendation, uh, we, considers, we consider it also to be a good practice for a credit institution to develop uh, products for financial, financing environmentally sustainable activities signed to the United Nations uh, principles for responsible banking or decrease their ecological footprint. For the latter uh, element, let me mention here that uh, OTP, the largest um, Hungarian uh, bank, has recently signed the principles uh, uh, I think it, this is a very positive uh, step, uh, which will hopefully be followed by others. Uh, if I can summarize uh, the, the recommendation, I think the most important part of that, that it's helped to change the mindset of the, of the banks. Uh, it helps to uh, change everybody's mindset who's con co connected to the financial uh, system because I think this is the most important at this stage, that, that if we can change it and we're scaling this, uh, this uh, 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 phenomena or green financing um, uh, phenomena, I think uh, we, we did a lot and then the others will come. So the ongoing gap analysis, the MMB expected credit institutions to carry out a self-assessment, including a detailed gap analysis in relation to the requirements detailed in this uh, recommendation. And uh, based on this uh, survey, to develop an ambitious but feasible plan to address the gaps uh, and to submit it to the MMB. The preliminary results of this analysis suggest that on average, banks comply with around one out of four of the supervisory expectation formulated in the recommendation. The lowest compliance uh, is observed regarding disclosure practices in the industry. The result of uh, this analysis will be used during the updated of the recommendation next year uh, to set realistic but ambitious supervisory expectations and uh, to pave the way for the supervisory inspections to check compliance. 
So uh, another tool that uh, we launched, the, the green preferential capital requirements, uh, to successfully uh, tackle climate change, we're seeing that positive incentives for the financial sector have to be in place in order to channel capital into the right direction. So to encourage institutions to mitigate their risks uh, stemming from climate change, especially their transitional risks, we started a green preferential capital treatment program to help the transition of uh, major climate change contributor sector like energy production or agriculture. Since our program uh, got underway, uh, almost 160 billion Hungarian foreign additional investment has been made towards renewable uh, energy production and uh, 72 billion Hungarian foreign towards uh, green bonds. So the building on the program successful adaptation we examine further possible, possible includable activities relying strongly on the EU taxonomy for sustainability activities. I think this is a quite new, uh, uh, quite new topic uh, to use the capitals uh, to, to facilitate the institutions towards a, a greener world. We will see the results and uh, uh, we have another uh, uh, result what we can uh, get from this program because uh, the requirements uh, to be part of this program is that they give us data, give us data about uh, their clients uh, and uh, and uh, I think it's also help to to uh, develop targeted uh, solutions to the sectors so sustainability has many elements uh, but long-term sustainability cannot be achieved without the reduction of our operational carbon uh, footprint and offsetting the, those emissions, which can be avoided. So with this mentality, we, ha we have been working towards carbon neutrality since uh, 2019, when we started our first carbon footprint offsetting program with the cooperation of the Worldwide uh, Fund. Since then, uh, we began the work to minimize our operational uh, operations emission and uh, started a large-scale project to offset our 2020 operations footprint entirely. The IMB measures are based on the best international practice uh, or practices available following the recommendation of the network for greening the financial system or, or uh, how we know the NGFS in short. NGFS is a network uh, and uh, we are a member of uh, that and we are so proud to be in, in the club. And uh, performing the climate stress test, releasing the recommendation on environmental risk and the other developments in the past year are aimed and the building awareness and intellectual capacity, integrating climate related risk into financial stability monitoring and other recommendations of the NGFS also. It is always pleasant uh, to receive positive feedback for our achievements, but it is a real honor when it comes from one of the most acclaimed experts on the topic of climate change and environment. The Worldwide uh, Fund for Nature in their recent report conducted an assessment of countries' sustainable finance regulations and central bank's activities. So 37 countries had been assessed along 68 indicators covering three aspects, environmental, climate, and social. And in numerous subcategories, uh, MMB's activities has been highly rated by WWF such uh, activities like macro, uh, micro prudential supervision and our leadership and international organization as well. We are extremely proud of, uh, of, of this uh, result. But during uh, this year, another recognition was received from one of the main national agents of corporate sustainability. So we, uh, MMB's road on sustainability began in 2019. Uh, with the development of our green program. Since then, many of our primary goals have been achieved, leading us to earn the Business Solution Award delivered 
by the Business Council for Sustainable Development in uh, Hungary. So we issue also a green financial report uh, each year. It is our intention to give a comprehensive picture uh, of the MMB's green activities and climate-related activities. We present the Hungarian green financing and climate risks of the domestic financial system and hence our 30-year climate stress test as well in depth. We will also present our teaching and researching activities and the winners of the Green Science, uh, uh, Science Awards. And the latest domestic and EU legal changes and major international events will be collected as well, uh, which we think will be especially useful for market participants and foreign organizations. Also, this will be published uh, in mid-spring uh, 2022, and uh, of course we will translate it in, in English uh, as well. So that was the past. Let's see the future. Although we have made a great progress, but we still have a long way to go. What lies ahead of, uh, of, uh, what, what, uh, lies ahead of us uh, by 2022, we have set ourselves important goals that we organize in four teams. I would like to address these uh, very shortly. First uh, theme is about identifying environmentally harmful activities. So since uh, the release of the Taxonomy the Climate Delegated Act, EU policymakers consider a possible extension to the taxonomy to include activities significantly harmful to environmental sustainability and activities which with no significant impact on environmental sustainability. Following the, the EU developments, the MMB would like to start working on identifying environmentally harmful activities that present transition risks to the financial institutions. Secondly, uh, we also would like to help environmentally conscious customers to scale up uh, green lending and investment among customers. We are designing a green product register that can help the market in many aspects. From a financial point of view, we would like to provide a tool for investors who seek green investments to be able to discover and compare investments opportunities. From a social point of view, the aim of to educate the public about the basics of green finance, what does a green investment mean, and how the, to assess whether an investment is a truly sustainable one, and how to check for signs pointing towards greenwashing. There is a growing uh, need from actors of the banking system for standardized form of uh, ESG measurement of their clients. The ESG scores are at the heart of uh, sustainability banking from uh, risk management to business strategy. A wide range of areas can be built on the ESG information. Unfortunately, the ESG data coverage uh, of Hungarian SMEs is rather low now. Uh, to tackle this problem, uh, we plan to work on a survey in the upcoming year, which can help credit institutions to assess the ESG performance of their clients. The survey's question will focus on climate-related information and uh, environmental sustainability considerations also. And last but not least, uh, the, the, third, uh, the fourth one, the question may arise, uh, as to what does the financial sector have to do with biodiversity loss. Researchers have identified five main drivers of uh, biodiversity loss. First, the climate change, which is already within the scope in the Hungarian banking uh, system. Second, the invasive species. Uh, third, overexploitation. Fourth, the pollution. And finally, the loss and the degradation of habitats. We will need to understand how these factors affect our financial system and the financial sector can do in terms of uh, financing to mitigate uh, biodiversity loss. So as you could uh, see, we have a lot to do 
and uh, all this in a little time uh, I, I invited all of you to be our partners in this journey of sustainability finance in 2022 as well and I hope uh, in a longer period and let's change uh, our uh, knowledge uh, let's discuss uh, uh, a lot of topics and uh, let's try to reach that uh, the next uh, couple of decades would be a greener one than the former ones. Thank you for your attention and uh, I also wish you a very fruitful discussion. I'm pretty sure that this day would be a very effective day, full of uh, very interesting uh, panels, discussions and uh, topics. Thank you very much. Mr. Kondaj, thank you for your welcoming thoughts and for your presentation. Now, ladies and gentlemen, before we move on to the presentations and discussions of today's conference, we have one more special keynote speech, a special address on EU taxonomy from Mr. Nathan Fabian, Chief Responsible Investment Officer at PRI and Chairperson at the European Platform on Sustainable Finance. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Nathan Fabian. Good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here today. If I might say, this is my first in-person event. Uh, since the beginning of uh, the lockdowns uh, over a year and a half ago. Uh, so it's an honor to be here, but it's also a great pleasure. Uh, and I congratulate you for having this conversation. Today, I would like to share a thought with you. And that is that green lending and investing is already growing rapidly. And markets have realized that a sustainable finance transition is underway. We can see this in the record commitments at the Glasgow Conference by the Green Finance Alliance. So that was an enormous number, wasn't it? $130 trillion of managed funds committing to net zero by 2050. We'll explore a little bit about what that means in my, in my remarks. And of course, we have rapidly growing investments and allocations to the green bond markets. So the markets have started to realize that the transition is on. But there is a lag in policy and there is a financing gap relative to the climate goals we have set for ourselves. And we need to close it. Because I put it to you, as with the Deputy Governor's excellent uh, scenario analysis that he presented to you, all of those scenarios had policy action within them. There will be policy action. It will accelerate. The only real question is whether it accelerates quickly enough to meet the goals for a safe climate. And of course, whether we can close the financing gap quickly enough. So transition disruption of some degree is in our future already. It's already commenced. Now, part of the challenge we have is that the traditional tools of financial markets, like discounting cash flows, like probability-weighted scenario analysis, when, when in fact we do look forwards and not backwards, these tools are not sufficient for us to make the decisions we need to to close that financing gap. And so there must be more. The EU has identified it needs, we need, 350 billion euros additional investment every year to 2030. This is mainly in transport, energy, buildings, to close our climate mitigation financing gap. 350 billion euros every year to 2030. It's a substantial sum, but it's not out of the reach of capital markets. It's within the reach of capital markets. The question is, do we have the tools? Do we have the way of identifying where the capital should flow to close that gap? Now, I'm going to start with a very simple chart. This. Uh, was the IEA, it was actually just before COP, but the values there are still similar. 
you can see that we need to move beyond the committed policies, the stated policies and the pledges to close that gap. And finance will play a role in that. My point to you is that governments will catch up. They will close that gap. And so we're trying to align the, f the finance in the markets with the future of those goals. Now, to answer the question on green taxonomy, and I can say what it is in more detail, but we must consider the broader policy suite being undertaken in Europe. Taxonomy is just one part. This is a, a nice simple expression of the pillars of that policy. So we have taxonomy as a cornerstone. It's a classification system of economic activities with environmental performance criteria. How good is good enough for a building, for a transport system, for energy generation, if we're to invest in that asset and it can contribute to meeting our climate goals. But we also have disclosure frameworks. We have a new corporate disclosure obligation. We have a financial product disclosure obligation in the SFDR. We have changes to stewardship obligations of investors, to uh, investor duties. We have new labelling regimes, the green bond standard, assuming it continues to develop the eco-label. And of course, we're starting to see capital weighting factors come into the market too, like you're doing here. The point is, the financial system is being rewired. You can't just drop a taxonomy in and assume that capital will change course. There is a rewiring of the financial system to make sure that in an intermediated system that's a complex system, all of the key levers are aligning the finance with sustainability outcomes. This is the big change. It's a generational change. And so whatever you think of taxonomy, there's much more going on behind the policy change box. Now, let's put it simply. That number at the bottom, or that example of, of a, a taxonomy alignment metric at the bottom, is what we hope to achieve in terms of the functions of the taxonomy. Can I look at a portfolio? Can I look at an investment product? Identify what proportion of the activities of that entity are aligned with the environmental criteria and then get an indication of the climate friendliness or the environmentally friendliness of that financial product. That's the aim. So really there's two parts of the system that we're changing with taxonomy. It's the sustainability performance benchmark itself, the environmental criteria, and it's the disclosure obligation. And so entities, companies, must disclose their alignment. Financial product issuers must disclose their alignment. Increasingly, banks are going to be required to disclose the alignment of their, their lending products. And this helps the market have what we call a common language, a way of interpreting how green are our portfolios? How aligned are they with goals? Now, the fact that that says only 10% should be an indication. We understand that we're not there yet. The alignment numbers are going to be small. We shouldn't be concerned. And frankly, more important than what that number says today is how we're expressing our transition plans, how we're saying that will increase over time by commuting our, getting our capital expenditure plans, our operating expenditure plans. Now, of course, with all of the excitement around the, the next uh, taxonomy criteria being debated in Brussels, it's important to point out that this all works much better if there is a scientific basis for the criteria. The more you drift from the science on the criteria, the more you start to introduce some challenges. All right, but I was asked to say, how will the tox taxonomy actually physically help? And there are actually many ways. Remember, we've got a, an intermediated system and you need to make changes through the system in multiple places. So for companies, they have a performance benchmark by which they can judge their CapEx plan. How should they transition their balance sheets in practice? What should the next CapEx decision be in terms of environmental performance? For financial product issuers, they have a way to validate the performance of a financial product. When they say, I'm an ESG investor, or I've got a sustainable financial product, there's a benchmark by which we can use to validate that. For institutional investors, 
They have a tool for granular active ownership and stewardship. No longer do we need to sit down with a board and say, do you get it? And the board says, yes, we get it. And that's the end of the conversation. We can say, okay, by when will you start to meet these criteria? What, how are you going to manage our capital in your company as you transition this company? When will we start to see the allocations? Will there be new raisings? For what? Will you issue new debt? For what? And we can have a much more granular conversation. This has been missing, but it's essential. And of course, for individual investors, pension holders, insurance policy holders, they start to have a way to express their preferences because there's a common tool that can link up the way the market is working. These are very important steps, and every little step matters. Now, will it lead to loans and capital flowing to sustainable activities? Will we close the financing gap with these tools? Well, I'd say to you that the early signals are quite encouraging. The sustainable finance disclosure, disclosure regulation, the one for financial products, I saw some reporting just this week about the commitments to the Article 8 and the Article 9 definitions of a sustainable financial product. Article 9 is the very green one. Article 8 is the partly green one. And already we're seeing over 3 trillion euros of managed funds identifying as Article 8. So part of that fund is flowing to green. And 270 billion euros identified as Article 9. Those funds have an explicit and express sustainability purpose. And of course they can use the taxonomy to validate that. So this, the funds growing and flowing into these sectors is already quite large. Now, we know there are limitations with markets. Secondary trading in debt and equity does not necessarily raise capital for new allocations and new activities. We all understand that. But some of the active ownership practices and the weighting and prioritisation of the greener stocks in portfolios can have an effect. And so even secondary markets play a role. And of course, there's always the concern that the market will just use taxonomy as a checklist and they won't think about what they're investing in. Personally, I don't accept that criticism. I think investors always think about what they're doing. But let's be clear, markets do like lists and so they will use it. <laughs> but will it lead to a green bubble? Will it lead to investors not thinking about where they're allocating their capital? I'd put it to you that the transition to meet our climate goals is what's driving the restructuring of the economy. And it's going to be the demand for assets to meet the climate goals. It's the fundamentals. It's not the tool that's describing the performance level that we need to reach it. Now, if I'm a user of the financial system, how do I tell if this has been worthwhile? I've just tried to capture in one simple slide that if I'm investing a euro, I can tell, for example, that 60 cents of my euro is going to support a better economy, a greener economy. 10 cents to biodiversity, 20 to recycling, 30 to tackle climate change. And I'm able to express that I want a financial product can, that can do that. And suddenly we've got our con a connection with the users of the financial system, the citizen savers for whom we, we operate the financial system. Let's not forget that, it's their money. And we have a way to connect to their interests and needs and make sure we get that demand signal coming through markets. All right, I think people know that there's a great amount of debate and scrutiny on what should be counted as green. And this is a hot discussion at the moment. So I just want to identify a couple of points. The taxonomy is being stretched and pulled well beyond its original intent. And I think that introduces risks to how we use it and we should be mindful of them. The taxonomy alone is not an energy policy to have an energy policy, you need to think about security of supply and cost questions and access questions. These are not answered in the taxonomy, so we shouldn't try and make the taxonomy criteria answer all these points. Taxonomy is part of an energy policy, not one in itself. It's not a public financing plan. We might need public money on investments to support just transition and the managed exit of emissions intensive and polluting assets. 
We won't call these green, but we'll certainly call their transition essential to meeting our climate goals. And so again, there are more considerations for public financing than just the taxonomy. The most common request we hear when developing criteria for the taxonomy is, we've agreed a regulation on how our industry, on the minimum performance standards in our industry, can't the taxonomy just direct financing to meet those standards? Well, the truth is if those regulations met the climate goals, yes, absolutely we could. But we're in catch-up mode. We're running behind. The regulations we've been negotiating in transport, in, in agriculture over the last decade do not yet reflect the goals we must achieve. And so we must look forward. And this is why taxonomy criteria are more ambitious than existing regulations and existing practice. It's necessary to close that ambition gap. It's not a substitute for a portfolio transition pathway. So if I'm a country, Germany's plan announced last week is really interesting. 2030, 80% renewables, 20% gas. Now, let's assume that when you do the maths, which I'm happy to take you through, on the average grid intensity in the German energy system, emissions intensity by 2030, they're probably going to come in around 80 grams per kilowatt hour, give or take. The European target, I think I've got a nice chart here actually, the European target by 2030 is average 100 grams per kilowatt hour by 2030. So the German energy strategy with a portfolio of assets of 20% gas, 80% renewables is going to make it under the European average by 2030. But does this mean we call methane burning environmentally sustainable in the taxonomy? No, it does not. These are separate ideas. And it's very reasonable for Germany to have that strategy to balance their grid and provide their energy. In fact, they probably must do it. But this does not make methane burning renewable or sustainable or green. It's just a necessary part of transition. And so taxonomy has some limitations in that regard. Sorry, I want to go back to my last point. This question of is it a good proxy for financial risk? Well, you're going to test that here, I think, on the green side with uh, the green encouragement, if you like, on capital requirements. I think the shorter path is on the risk side, on the so-called red or significant harm side. I know there's great interest in both. So let's just discuss that very briefly. The platform on sustainable finance is talking about what a, f a fully evolved taxonomy could look like. We've got the green, but we realise that central banks, among others, and other risk assessors in the market would like to know what significantly harmful looks like. And can we agree a benchmark on that? The market always shudders. I don't want to be holding the assets or in the company that's in that category. I understand that. We need to take a great deal of care with this. But if we do it well, we get to describe transition in a much more clear and useful way for markets. I showed you this, these, all these arrows because we know that transition is going to start in different places, it's going to end in different places for different assets and different types of economic activities. Now, I can move from significant harm to substantial contribution today in the current taxonomy just by disclosing my CapEx plan, and I can count that as green. So if I'm at the top arrow, maybe extending to significant harm is not so important. But if I can only get to intermediate performance, and I want to say to the market, I know I've got an emissions problem, but I can make investments that's going to bring me down for the next five or six years consistent with a national emissions pathway, that's an investment worth making. And that the costs and, and the risk on that capex and the underlying assets has been made, that's useful. And so we're very interested in this intermediate transition category. And we really would like to extend it, noting we need to take some care on the significant harm part. All right. So Taxonomy, as you can tell, is something that I could talk about underwater, uh, and through the day I'm happy to answer any questions. But as we contemplate the future, let's just have a look at what's happening around the world. The idea that we need to measure the environmental performance of our investments, in addition to our usual financial management and risk tools, but that we manage and measure the environmental performance has taken hold. Many countries are developing their own taxonomy. 
Sometimes it's because they're concerned about their industry transition. Sometimes it's because they know they need their financial sector to move. Hopefully we'll see some harmonisation in time. But I think this development, this many taxonomies underway, reflects the transition is already happening. What we need is ways to scale it efficiently, to protect the integrity of our financial markets by making sure all of those actors in that system do and say what they mean, what they say they're doing. So they're on our, on our tins. It says on the tin exactly what's inside. That's what we need. And this is what taxonomies can give us. And if we implement them well and sensibly and guided by the science, we will be able to meet our climate financing goals and close that gap. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you today. And thank you for your presentation, Mr. Fabian. Ladies and gentlemen, the first section of today's event will focus on developments in sustainable finance after COP26. Our first speaker will be Ms. Teresa Czerwinska, Vice President of the European Investment Bank. And she will be giving her presentation in a pre-recorded format addressed especially to today's event. Vice President Czerwinska's areas of oversight include the financing of science, education, innovation, and the digital economy, InvestEU, implementation of three lines of defense, financing operations in Croatia, Hungary, Poland, the Eastern Partnership countries, Central Asia, China, and Mongolia, and relations with the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. So now, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome a pre-recorded address by Ms. Teresa Czerwinska. Your Excellences, ladies and gentlemen, it's a privilege to represent the European Investment Bank, the Bank of the European Union and the EU Climate Bank, and address this distinguished forum organized by the Central Bank of Hungary. I regret that I am unable to join you today due to the pandemic-related restrictions and hope that these restrictions will soon be long behind us. I am very grateful to our Hungarian partners at the Magyar Nemzeti Bank for recognizing green financing as one of the key issues faced by the financial sector today and for putting it on the national agenda. Hungary was among the first EU countries to ratify the Paris Agreement. It is very reassuring to see key national institutions like the MNB following the suite and mobilizing the local financial community for the climate action. I'd like to congratulate the Central Bank of Hungary and its governor, Mr. Matoci Kjörg, for the green program launched in 2019. This is an impressive step towards mitigating the risks associated with climate change and expanding green financial services in Hungary. I am very happy that an institution pioneering green finances like the MNB recognized EIB as one of the key players in the European Union in climate action and sustainable financing. Ladies and gentlemen, the EIB is a unique financial institution. We are at the same time EU bank, climate bank and Hungarian bank. We are the EU bank because 27 member countries of the EU are our owners. We are the biggest multilateral financial institution in the world and one of the largest providers of climate finance we have around 77 billion euros invested in projects around the world every year. Our involvement in climate action amounts to over one third of this investment, which is 24 billion euros per year. We are also taking steps to contribute to the achievement of the sustainable development goals in the EU and outside. The bank supports EU policy in partner countries outside the EU with the establishment of our new development branch announced this year. We call ourselves Climate Bank because we are the first multilateral bank in the world with its operations fully aligned with the Paris Agreement. 
we will further substantiate our climate credentials with our ambitious plans to have half of our annual lending in support of climate action by 2025. We will also mobilize 1 trillion euros by 2030 to support the global climate action towards carbon neutrality of our economies by 2050. As the EU Climate Bank, we will be backing the European Green Deal, including its just transition mechanism. And finally, EIB is a Hungarian bank, but not only because we are partially owned by Hungary, but also because of the decades of investing in Hungary which contributed to the Hungarian social and economic growth. We are very proud of this role. EIB is partnering Hungary since 1991 and since then we have invested in Hungarian economy 23 billion euros. Hungarian proverb says, luck brings friends, need tries them. COVID-19 pandemic shocked our life and disrupted our working routines at the scale unseen in Europe since the end of the Second World War. The IB is very proud to see that our partnership is surviving this ongoing test. We managed to continue with our support for Hungarian citizens and national economy despite all the challenges the pandemic imposed. In 2019 and 2020 alone, the EIB invested close to 1.5 billion euros in Hungary, supporting, for example, faster recovery of Hungarian SMEs, as well as country's healthcare sector. This ensured that Hungarians can keep jobs and incomes, and Hungarian doctors, nurses, and emergency responders have the right equipment to fight the pandemic, save lives, and launch the national vaccination campaign. Our bank is ready to do more to accelerate Hungarian recovery from COVID-19. To make this recovery quick and effective in Hungary and Europe, we need to tie this recovery with the climate action and ensure the two processes support and reinforce each other. Let me now focus on the most important messages I would like to share with you today. No doubt, digitalization and innovation will be two pivotal areas for the success of COVID recovery and climate action. Investments in digitalization and innovation will also determine whether the EU will lead the global economy or follow others. We need to create new industries and offer more training to help everyone make the transition successful. The pandemic underlined the importance of good digital infrastructure for the seamless functioning of our societies and its crucial sectors like education or medical care. We can joke that the invisible virus did more for digitalization of our economies than all the governments and companies put together. This joke, however, will not be far from the truth. Ladies and gentlemen, as discussed at COP26, innovation will be the key for the success of the climate action. The global crisis of an unprecedented size like the climate change requires global solidarity and global effort. This includes the financial sector too. Financial institutions will have to act as transformers and ensure our economy has enough power to finish these processes with success. We can proudly say that the banking sector will have one of the key roles in saving the planet and ensuring our fast and effective transformation into green, sustainable and circular economies. European Investment Bank is already in the middle of an important transition. We will support the creation of a new financing ecosystem for the net zero transition as outlined in our Climate Bank Roadmap. We are taking decisive action to ensure the EU and the world can effectively tackle the climate change as the biggest challenge of modern times. Europe and Hungary can be proud of our achievements to date. 
Following COP26, our multi-level approach to climate action will see increased engagement with multilateral and bilateral financial institutions. The goal will be to ensure that the financial sector moves jointly to reach global climate ambitions. An example of that joint efforts is the Finance in Common Summit or the Common Principles what that established among MDBs and harmonized with international development finance club members in order to track our green financing activities. Let me also quote other initiatives such as the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, the Network for Greening the Financial System and lately International Platform on Sustainable Finance. All of them are crucial in developing sustainable finance and transparent reporting on climate-related risks. EIB wants to lead the green transformation of the financial sector and we want to lead by example. As part of the EU Green Deal, the European Commission presented its renewed sustainable finance strategy in 2020. This is a key pillar of our green transformation. To make it happen, we need partners like the Central Bank of Hungary. Joint efforts will be crucial to move forward. Speaking about green transformation, one needs to answer the question, what is green? To answer this seemingly simple question, it is important to find a common language, or as we call it, a common taxonomy across the financial sector. This taxonomy will help us define and understand what is green and what is not. EIB is actively contributing to the European Commission's work in this area. EU taxonomy will enhance comparability for investors facilitating their dialogue. At the same time, it applies to the whole investment chain directly linking sustainable finance with the real economy. The application of the EU taxonomy on the lending side is turning into a competitive edge for the funding side. Investors can now refer to a clear regulatory framework for the comparison of investment alternatives. In other words, it also pays off to be green. Consequently, we contribute to another key aspect of green and sustainable financing, the development of EU green bond standard. Proposed in July 2021, the standard is a crucial element of the Commission's sustainable finance strategy. As a global pioneer in terms of transparency and accountability related to the issues of green bond EIB has a lot to say in this process. EU green bond standard is something the financial sector should pay particular attention. EU taxonomy and green bond standards will allow us to raise the amount of investment needed to fund COP26 commitment and protect the climate. Green and now social and sustainability bonds are growing fast, but they are still a small part of the whole bond market. As global pioneers in the green board market, we understand the potential for growth in this unique investment tool. Dear colleagues, it's clear that COVID-19 has derailed global efforts in meeting the sustainable development goals. At the same time, the consequences of the climate crisis continue to unfold and environmental degradation makes a significant impact on people across the world. It is imperative to ensure COVID-19 does not dilute our collective commitment to the climate and sustainable growth agendas. We also must continue towards meeting the commitments taken at COP26. Even if COP26 results may not be perfect, they all step in the right direction. We have to prevent devastating climate changes and we must act decisively, globally and quickly. Our success will depend on our ability to use scarce public resources better and mobilize private investment for climate and environmental action.
This is why conferences like this one are important. They raise the awareness of the pivotal role of financial sector. I would like to thank Central Bank of Hungary once again for the energy and the effort invested in organizing this conference. It clearly shows the key role of sustainable financing for the success of the climate action and preservation of our planet for future generations. Thank you very much for your kind attention. And thank you very much, Ms. Czerwinska. And now, ladies and gentlemen, our next speech will be presented by Mr. Bernard W. Schiesel, who leads the work on second opinions and data strategy at Cicero Shades of Green. Prior to joining Cicero Shades of Green, Mr. Schiesel served as an advisor on climate finance at the International Climate Research Institute, Cicero. He was awarded the German and the Swiss Madcartel Fellowship on International Affairs, focusing on international climate politics and climate finance in different political contexts. Contexts, Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Mr. Bernard W. Schiesel. Hello everyone, good morning. I would like to thank uh, the Central Bank for hosting this event, uh, and I'm very glad to be back in Budapest, uh, also one of my uh, first in-person events again after the pandemic. Uh, so I'm glad to, to be back uh, and to talk about climate finance with you today. And I would like to start with a, a little bleak message, uh, unfortunately, um, but I, I'm sure we will get to some opportunities and positive notes along as well. So since I worked in a climate science institute, and I have worked in climate finance for a long time, I always have to bring a graph. And uh, this graph, of course, is not a good graph because it shows the temperature increase. It shows the model temperature pathway starting from 2000 all the way to 2100. And as you can see, um, we have surpassed the one degree already. This has been quite um, um, often in the press after the IPCC. And we will very likely reach the 1.5 degrees too. Um, my colleagues, Ida Songnas and Glenn Peters, who have uh, published this study very recently in Nature Climate Change, have said that basically what we see here, the current policies lead to about 2.3 to 2.9. And this does not take into account the new pledges. With the NDCs, we will reach around 2.2 to 2.7. These are all different models for temperature pathways. These are not the uncertainties. These are just different models. And what it means is when we go out of the COP and we hear numbers like 2.4 or 2.7 before, these are also just a median number. With the uncertainties and the different models we have here, we could very easily reach 3.8 degrees. We could also reach 1.8 degrees. So the spread is enormous. And that just means for us that when we finance infrastructure, we can't necessarily rely on the ambition, the, the communicated targets. We have to think about the risks that come with the infrastructure investments because the numbers on the temperatures vary greatly. Similarly, I brought another graph because I like graphs so much. It shows the annual global emissions. And it also shows the, well, the below 1.5 degrees and the 1.5 degrees low overshoot models towards 2100 again. And it shows how the emissions would go down. What you can see is, of course, they are very different models. They all look a little bit different. But in general, the emissions have gone up all the way to now. We have a little dip during the COVID, but we're already back to, or more or less back to where it was before. And it has to go very steep down. We have to halve emissions in about 10 years in order to stay on the 1.5 or the 1.5 with a little bit overshoot scenario. What if we don't get that right? I wanted to bring one example um, of an event that has been widely considered as the first 
climate-related bankruptcy, and that is the PG&E bankruptcy in 2019. Uh, PG&E had to file for bankruptcy after a, a range of wildfires, devastating wildfires, costing the lives of about 80 people, um, has led to civil liabilities of 30 billion uh, US dollars. So they saw basically PG&E to be responsible for not maintaining the equipment well enough and the equipment was leading to a spark and that led to a wildfire and that led to the, the market cap, the company, plummeting. And so the, the point I'm trying to make here is that investors in companies, be it utility companies, but generally any infrastructure company, by now have an interest in understanding how well the companies are managing these climate risks. And when I'm saying climate risks, I mean two different risks. They were mentioned earlier already. I'm talking about physical risks and transition risks. Physical risks include acute risks, but it also includes chronic risks, like sea level rise. The transition risk, of course, include that there might be changes in policy, that there might be liabilities and technology changes. But all, all of these risks, physical and transition risk, directly translate into certain potential financial risks, be it supply chain disruptions, be it direct impacts on the production facilities, be it changes in consumer behavior. All of these risks are real. And if you're an investor, you want to know about these risks. You want to know if your investments are safe. So when you go looking at these elements, you're thinking, COP, they're probably going to deliver a lot on that. And they, they partly do. At COP, we have new ambitions, new temperature um, calculations based on the communicated pledges. We have language related to uh, the phase down of unabated coal. Uh, we have subsidies being phased out for fossil fuels, inefficient subsidies. We also have what Nathan mentioned, the Glasgow Net Zero Financial Alliance, which has convened a number of actors managing around 130 trillion um, who committed to reduce their emissions to net zero. Of course, here we have to see how quickly, how ambitious, how credible all these plans will be. This is all an, like a decision that you have to look at on a case-by-case -case basis. But it is a sign that the private sector is actually following up on what I just mentioned with regards to the risks. Of course, at COP, there was also a lot of talk about the 100 billion pledge. And the 100 billion pledge is the pledge being made by the developed countries towards the most vulnerable countries, which has not been reached, which might be reached in 2023. Um, but this is only a small drop in the bucket, because as it also has been mentioned, we need hundreds of billions, we need trillions to actually make that happen. And the private sector and the financial industry has the capital available, and they have an immediate interest based on the risk exposure they, they have to allocate that capital in a way that is less risky. And one way to accommodate climate risks in financing that was mentioned before is, was the topic of green bonds. I work for the largest review of green bonds globally when it comes up to cumulative emissions. So we've been involved since the early inception of the market, looking at this green bond market grow. Now last year reaching more than 250 billion of volume of green bond issuance. And this year we're currently at around 410 billion and a cumulative emission of about 1.5 trillion. This is not the only sustainable debt instrument. What was mentioned before, the green bond market here is around 200, more than 250. I have this number here on the right graph. The other sustainability-related labelings, like the social bonds, sustainability-linked products, and others, are coming up as well. But the real driver over the last years were the green bond market. What is green? That question came up many times today. Um, the taxonomy is one approach to trying to define a system. Um, I remember Mark Carney, uh, the former governor of England, saying that a taxonomy, of course, is a good start, 
but it is a binary system. And in order to accommodate of the complexity of the system, you need, I think he said, 50 shades of green. We only offer three um, from the climate science perspective. We developed that in 2015 to make it very easy for investors to understand how climate risks could be classified. We also have non-green shades, yellow and red. Of course, they don't apply to green bonds. But the green shades that we have here basically try to capture the different elements of risk that come with investment frameworks. So for us, what we see is, of course, low carbon, climate resilient, and something of a 2050 perspective, this is something we see as dark green. Light green, on the end of the green scale, would be something that is efficiency improvement, something that makes infrastructure better, that is substantially better. And medium green is somewhere in between, where we look at hybrid solutions, solutions that are bridging towards 2050. I'm bringing this up because it is every time we do an assessment, an individual decision where the shading lands. We have thought about a taxonomy, but we've reached that point where we realize everything is an individual research per project that depends on the context, on the region, that depends on the governance um, of the issuer. So it makes it extremely complex to actually land on one of these shades to classify the risk. Of course, when we talk about shades of green, they're not a quality judgment. We, for example, assessed the green bond framework of Hungary, and there we had all shades. We had the dark green shades, renewable energy investments. We had medium green shades for maintenance of fossil fuel, transportation, uh, public transportation. We had also light green for efficiency improvements. And they all represent important steps towards a 2050 solution. They're just different on a risk scale because some might be closer to fossil investments than others. When we look further, green bonds have been our first step of transparency. Of course, companies have a lot more investments and revenue streams. So in these, it is important to be transparent. And so we say yellow and red would be investment revenue streams that needs to be either transitioned or phased out. And then investors have the choice. Do they want to engage? Do they want to divest? What do they want to do? So basically what we are saying with these shades is we provide an additional layer to the discussed taxonomy to kind of provide more transparency and to provide the context that is necessary to make a decision on the actual risk exposure, because as we learned, the taxonomy wasn't necessarily designed to capture all of these elements. So this is already my last slide. I just wanna put this slide up again, showing you the different temperature settings from the climate action tracker. Again, the main point here is current policy is 2.7 degrees outcome by the end of the century. Pledges and targets 2.1. Optimistic targets 1.8. These are all the different outcomes depending on what we're gonna achieve, how we're gonna implement policy, how we're gonna follow up. But it is important that every investor makes a decision on their risk exposure they wanna take uh, independently on where we're landing in terms of targets. Because eventually every little bit counts. So we can't just rely on every policy decision. We also have to, as a financial community, make our decisions on a case-by-case -case risk basis. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. Schiesel. Ladies and gentlemen, our next presentation will be held by Mr. Gergely Porkos, head of the Green Program Directorate of OTP Bank Hungary. For eight years, Mr. Porkos worked as a consultant at McKinsey & Company's European and Asian offices in the banking, telecommunications, and energy sectors. From 2012, as the deputy CEO of the Bonafarm Group, the largest agricultural group in the region, he managed large investments in the field of business development, acquisitions, and business transformations. 
He joined the team of OTP Bank in early 2021, where, among other things, the bank is responsible for ESG's business transformation. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Mr. Gergely Pokos. Thank you very much for having me. It's a real pleasure uh, to be here and an honor to speak at uh, such a distinguished conference. Now, um, my colleagues and I are uh, responsible uh, for the ESG strategy and the ESG program uh, of OTP Bank, a banking group which uh, comprises 11 countries, more than 16 million customers, uh, quite a lot of employees, a lot of branches, big operation here in uh, Central and, and Eastern Europe. So um, today I want to talk about uh, the banking perspective, our perspective of, uh, of sustainable finance, of ESG, and of, uh, of what we can do to battle uh, climate change. Now I should say up front that um, this is obviously a, a very large topic and we've heard uh, quite a few aspects of it today already. My, uh, my perspective will be somewhat different, somewhat more practical, but will only show you a narrow uh, version of everything we do. Obviously, there are time restrictions here, but I will be very happy to talk to you on an individual level or, or offline later on today or at a, at a different time. Now, first, um, uh, to, to stick with the, with the theme of the, of the conference, uh, how do we evaluate uh, COP26? Was it a success or a failure? What does it mean uh, for banks in, in our region? What does it mean for us? Um, our very, very brief summary of, of the conference for us is it, it, it probably had uh, worse publicity than it deserved, but we believe that, um, that it will potentially have a great great legacy. Did it magically solve all uh, climate-related issues? Of course not. Uh, we've seen the pledges, uh, we've, seen, we've, we've all read the papers. Uh, if, you went, if someone went into, uh, into, uh, into COP26 with the mindset that this will be the turning point, um, they were disappointed. However, uh, we at OTP and I myself personally, I'm a strong believer that uh, the the contributions that uh, that some of the uh, some of the outcomes of uh, of COP26 will make in the long term to tackling climate change, to uh, transitioning to a more sustainable future, are um, currently somewhat underplayed, but will have a very long and very positive legacy. I would especially like to. Uh, to focus on two aspects of, of this. One is uh, the methodology of carbon accounting, and I will talk a little bit about this uh, in a few minutes. And the other one is the, um, um, the first steps or, or, or some of the first steps towards a market-driven greenhouse gas reduction um, drive. Now, um, uh, you might ask, you know, what, what does it have to do with a practical approach? What does it have to do with a, with a Central European Bank um, in, um, in its day-to-day -day operation? Uh, I think a lot. I think much, much more than, uh, than meets the eye first. And uh, let me talk to you uh, a little bit about this. So what can we do here in Central and Eastern Europe with the outcomes of COP26? What can we do today? tomorrow to, um, to build a more sustainable future and to combat climate change. Now, uh, when we started tackling uh, the whole issue of sustainable finance and ESG at OTP, most of the discussions we had were about risk, which is obviously a good thing since uh, a lot of this uh, is about risk and, and a lot of what we heard today are about risks of climate change. However, Today, I want to make you ma mainly talk to you about opportunities, business opportunities. Now, we've heard, and, and you can see on the chart, that the, uh, the, the global 
capi annual capital investment required to tackle climate change is enormous. Uh, some of the numbers on this chart are, are so big, I cannot even cope uh, or, or start to understand them. But, uh, but obviously, if you translate this to any region, if you translate it to any country, you will still have very big numbers. Now, these numbers need to be financed. Some of that financing will go through banks. Well, um, apart from the, uh, from the financing requirement, the, the tasks are, are, um, are quite big as well. And, um, and virtually all industries will need to go to, uh, to net zero. Not all of them, but virtually all of them. You can imagine that this will require substantial investments in all aspects of, of life. So it's a big financing task. It's a big practical task. It's so big, some, but sometimes uh, people or even institutions get overwhelmed with, okay, so how do we tackle this? What do we do today? We, we are working on our risks policies. We are trying to understand the taxonomy and other regulations, but you know, what can we do to, to, um, to actually do something about it? And, and our answer is, for ourselves, now this is our approach, I'm, I'm not saying this is a universal well, but this is how we, we, we are t trying to tackle the problem. So our answer is, First of all, let's not only look at the, at the risks, uh, let's, uh, let's begin to realize that this is an opportunity. It is as much as a, a business opportunity as it is, uh, as it is a risk. And, um, and secondly, let's, uh, instead of trying to tackle the whole problem at once, let's start with some of the aspects of the problem that, uh, that are close to us, that are relevant to us, and where, where the, um, the, the choices, the investments, the, the lending, is, uh, is practical, and, uh, and we've selected a few of these, um, of these uh, opportunities. Now, um, the first is energy. Now, the energy sector in Central and Eastern Europe has uh, quite a few challenges. You can see some highlights uh, on the slide of, of the uh, current uh, elect electricity generation in different countries. Now, depending on whether those countries have access to, um, to, uh, to uh, uh, nuclear power or, um, or, uh, or, or water-based power. Obviously, their, their uh, reliance on coal and other fossil fuels is different. But we can, in general, say that the region has a big hurdle to tackle in terms of transitioning its electricity generation or energy industry. If we look at the, the, the energy industry, not, not, uh, not uh, at its current stage, but, but more forward-looking, we can also say that um, there is a substantial investment required in, in the installed capacities, and a lot of that investment is, um, is in renewable energy. Now, so there is a lot to reduce. There are a lot of risks, but there's also a lot of opportunities. There's a lot of investment required. So... Um, so you need to have, uh, you need to have a, a, an approach within your bank that tackles both, not only the risk side, but also um, uh, the business perspective. So from a business perspective, if, if I look at this, I say, you know, this is great. This is, this is fantastic. In, in, the, in the coming years, our clients and our prospective clients will invest a lot of money in, uh, in their infrastructure. They will build uh, wind farms. They will build... Um, uh, solar panels, they will do all these things, and uh, we will be able to finance that. Isn't that fantastic? We will also need to worry about risks, of, of course. Now, the other, um, the other thing that, or the other element of, of, um, of, the, of, of tackling climate change that is, comes natural and comes practical to a, to a banking establishment here in the region is, has to do with buildings and, and real estate. Um, also, a very, very large chunk of what needs to change if we want to tackle climate change. Now, this is true, by the way, globally, but uh, uh, I believe it is especially true here in this region. Um, if you look at buildings in Central and Eastern Europe, and this, by the way, is only a, a snapshot of the residential buildings, but uh, you can ex extrapolate this, you can look at others. But if you only look at the residential buildings in the region, we see that the, the bulk of the residential real estate was built between 1945 and 1990. This is, in, in Hungary, it is far more than half of the, of the residential square meters, which is not an area that is best known for efficient, um, efficient investment or efficient building systems. So this means that, uh, that virtually 
the complete residential building stock that we have will need to be overhauled in the coming years. It means investment in, uh, in, in heating, investment in insulation, investment in, 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 in windows, and so on, and so on, and so on. Now, um, all this will need to lead to a re reduction in, 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 on, on the right-hand side of the chart in the residential energy consumption. Now, uh, obviously, energy consumption has a lot of aspects and a, and a lot of uh, different uh, variables. If you look in the cold part, you, you, you consume a lot of energy for heating. If you live in a hot part of the world, you consume the energy for, for cooling. But fundamentally, things will need to change. So what does this mean for a bank? Well, first of all, again, the risk part. Big bulk of the collateral for the, for the European banking system is tied up in residential buildings, and that collateral will need to be overhauled. But there's also the opportunity part. This means that all of our clients will need to, um, uh, will need to make investments in their real estate in the coming years, and we will need to play a part in financing that change. Here's the opportunity. It's a business opportunity. It's good for climate change. It's good for everyone. However, let's not forget that... Um, this also means that millions of people, millions of families in, in, in our part of the world, in, in these different countries, will need to make substantial financial contributions. They will need to have com make commitments that uh, sometimes stifle them. Um, so, uh, from, the, from the climate risks, there's also social risks involved in a transition like this, and I would like to especially point back to the uh, role of the of the Hungarian National Bank that uh, realizes these risks and helps uh, families with, uh, with programs like the Green Housing Program. I, I believe we need more of this if we want to avoid uh, converting um, a climate challenge into a social challenge. Last but not least, um, um, also something that is, uh, that is a, a practical point for today, um, there is a completely new uh, industry being formed in front of our eyes, which is what we call the carbon, carbon accounting industry. Now, we have heard today the high-level approach to this, but just imagine if we want to make sure that in all of our economies and, and all of our clients have accurate carbon accounting, just, just start to count the number of people, experts, that will need to be involved in something like this. And I'm not talking about only the large companies. I'm talking about Everybody, all the SMEs, all the small businesses, individual households, and so on and so on. So this is also something that I believe banks in this region, and by the way, all over the world, will need to play an active part in. This is a new service that we can and will provide, will need to provide, partly to manage our own risks, but partly because it is, an, it is a service that will need uh, to be provided. Now... Um, so with all this in mind, uh, OTP Group has formulated uh, its uh, ESG or sustainability strategy uh, earlier this year, and it has been adopted by, by the board. So in summary it goes, OTP Group is aiming to be the regional leader in financing a fair and gradual transition to a low carbon economy and building a sustainable future through our responsible solutions. Now, you know, this sounds all very high level, but I would like to point your attention to three key aspects of this. Number one, uh, we believe that it is our bank's duty and also interest to finance the transition. We don't want to be a ba the bank that says, you know, this and this we don't do. We will uh, keep with our uh, clients in all different economies and help them make the necessary investments to, uh, to uh, fulfill the transition. Number two, it needs to be a fair transition. I just pointed to some of the, very quickly pointed to some of the social challenges that we will face in this part of the region. These cannot be ignored. If we want to have a successful transition, these will need to be tackled and everyone will need to play a part in this. And number three, it's a gradual transition. It will not open, happen over time. There is no magic wand. COP26 was not it. And there's no other, uh, other ones like this either, but the graduality the, the actual making the change happen, making the transition happen, will be helped a lot by some of the things that are underway, like making carbon accounting an actual effect. 
So with this strategy in mind, we are focusing currently on four key, um, four key industries. We talked about energy, we talked about buildings. We are, we believe, quite profi proficient in agriculture and financing agriculture. So we, are, we have a focus on this and electromobility also. But in terms of practical large scale finance, green finance that we can do, energy and buildings will be definitive uh, for the coming years. Last but not least, and I'm conscious that I'm, I am running out of time, but uh, please bear with me for another minute, is, um, is, uh, is what are we actually doing? What are some of our commitments? We are in the process of introducing a green landing framework. I will not bore you with details about this, but we have set ourselves some targets that, uh, that I would like to uh, just, just list out for you. These are only for our Hungarian operations. We are in the process of committing to targets for the group also. First and foremost, we are building our green book. We believe this is the most important step that we can take to actually make the transition happen. As I talked to you about, we are actively uh, financing and we are committing to long-term, being long-term financiers of, of the transition. We have already five products in the market and, uh, and uh, by end of, end of 2023 we believe that uh, we will no longer have different products for green and not green. This will be an integral part, business as usual, of our operations. We are also committed to reducing our own emissions because this is as much about walking the walk as it is about talking the talk. Um, OTP here in Hungary will be net carbon neutral in its own operations, so that means scope one and scope two emissions by end of next year. Um, and we are uh, looking into making the whole operation uh, carbon neutral. And last but not least, transparency. Um, as was mentioned before by the deputy governor, um, we have become members of the UN's principle for responsible banking. Um, a couple of months ago, and, uh, and we have set ourselves what we believe is quite an ambitious target to be listed in the Dow Jones Sustainability Index by 2025, which is an invitational index, um, and, uh, and, and us as a publicly traded company uh, will we'll do, do, try to do everything to, uh, to be mentioned in this um, quite exclusive club, we believe. So um, thank you very much for your time, and I will be very happy to talk to you later on today. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation, Mr. Pogos. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the final presentation of this session will be delivered by Eugene Wong. CEO of the Sustainable Finance Institute of Asia, who will be joining us online. The Sustainable Finance Institute of Asia is an independent institute established to catalyze ideas on sustainable finance at the policy level, as well as propel action in support of those policy ideas in Asia, particularly in the ASEAN region. Eugene was previously the Managing Director, Corporate Finance and Investments of the Securities Commission of Malaysia. Prior to that, he held positions in a merchant bank, a stockbroking company, and in the corporate finance division of an international accounting firm. And following Mr. Wong's presentation, today's speakers will engage in a panel discussion. But first, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome online Mr. Eugene Wong. MNB for inviting me to share what's happening in Southeast Asia and also for allowing me to do this virtually uh, owing to travel restrictions. So the um, topic of my presentation is sustainable finance in Asia, what's next? Well, before we can go on to the what's next, I think it's very important for me to share with you where we have been uh, in order to determine our direction moving forward after COP26. Let me first start off by sharing with you about Southeast Asia. So, what is Southeast Asia? So Southeast Asia is the highlighted region, as you can see. It has a population of 660 million and projected to be 770 million by 2040. It's the fifth largest economy currently, projected to be the fourth largest by 2030, uh, at that time of growing that of Japan and the EU. We have a GDP per capita 
per annum of 4,850, with the highest at 64,000 and the lowest at 1,400. So you can see the vast um, divergence in our GDPs and economic growth. The Association of Southeast Asian Nations, commonly known as ASEAN, is a re regional grouping of the 10 Southeast Asian states to promote economic, political and security cooperation amongst its members. So who's responsible for pol financial policy direction in Southeast Asia? Well, under the ASEAN finance cooperation process, four sectoral bodies coordinate these initiatives. They are the ASEAN Capital Markets Forum, which is actually the grouping of capital market regulators, the ASEAN Insurance Regulators Meeting, the name speaks for itself, the ASEAN Senior Level Committee on Financial Integration, which is the central banks, and the ASEAN Working Committee on Capital Market Development, which comprises the central banks, the capital market regulators and the ministries of finance looking after government and quasi-government capital market interests as well as cross-cutting issues. Now, we all know that one of the key pillars for a successful sustainable finance ecosystem is to have common definitions. And ASEAN's first attempt um, at this was to have common standards for green, social and sustainability bonds. These standards were issued in 2017 and 2018 and issuances either label uh, under these standards or who are directly aligned with these standards have now reached 24.5 billion US dollars by no the beginning part of uh, November this year. I mean, it's interesting to note that uh, the ASEAN sustainability bond suite was very ahead of its time. And in fact, uh, it did not allow any form of fossil fuels, which was very unusual uh, in 2017. So the ASEAN Sustainable Finance Agenda is guided by uh, three strategic documents issued by the financial policymakers. The first is the ASEAN Capital Market Forum's roadmap for ASEAN Sustainable Capital Markets. The second is the Central Bank's report on the roles of central banks in managing climate environment related risk. And the third is the Working Committee on Capital Market Development's report on promoting sustainable finance in ASEAN. And all these reports are available online. You can just Google them and uh, pick them up. So, um, the financial regulators uh, and policymakers of ASEAN have actually identified four key priorities for sustainable finance in ASEAN. The first three, which I will now highlight to you, are actually key pillars for a robust and effective sustainable finance ecosystem. So these are having a taxonomy, transition standards and disclosures. The fourth priority is on implementation. Because there's no use building a road, and that's what regulators and policymakers do, they build roads. There's no use building a road if you don't have the cars to use it. So it is very important in conjunction with um, having all the key pillars to actually strengthen demand and supply for sustainable finance. I'd like to talk a bit about the taxonomy um, because it's one of the key priorities and you know, we hear a lot about taxonomies and the importance of taxonomies. Well, the four sectoral bodies I, I talked about just now have actually come together to coordinate progress on cross-cutting sustainable finance initiatives um, in the region. And they have come together to establish the ASEAN Taxonomy Board to facilitate the development of an ASEAN taxonomy. Now, this taxonomy is intended to cater to all the financial subsectors, be it uh, banking, capital markets, or insurance, and also for the ministries of finance to use as well as to all our 10 countries. And you know, I just mentioned just now how diverse our 10 countries are. So the establishment of this taxonomy board uh, is actually intended to develop, maintain and promote uh, the ASEAN taxonomy. And the establishment of the board was endorsed at the seven ASEAN finance ministers and central bank governors meeting held on the 30th of March this year. And uh, actually version one of the ASEAN taxonomy was already released on November the 10th uh, recently. The ASEAN Taxonomy Board is overseen by the finance ministers and central bank governors collectively, and it's hosted by uh, our organization, the Sustainable Finance Institute Asia. So let me share with you how this board is structured, because we want it to be inclusive. We wanted to make sure that all our member states, uh, as well as all the different work streams within uh, uh, ASEAN, uh, the four work streams I talked about, would have a say in how this taxonomy is constructed so it can be used for various purposes and by every party. And the board was constructed in such a way to have members representing all our member states. So you can see all our 10 member states are there, as well as the four sectorial uh, bodies, which I mentioned just now. Now, transition 
which is the second element I spoke of just now, is actually very important. It is a key part of ASEAN sustainability journey because we, we, we simply can't flick a switch and turn green or be sustainability aligned overnight. We need a transition. Um, and the transition needs to be balanced as be credible and meaningful, yet orderly to minimize economic and social uh, dislocations. This is especially so given the diversity uh, in our social and economic structures in the region and also the different states of development that we are facing. The central banks uh, of ASEAN have been very careful to note, as you can see on the slide, that they will take a gradual and or phased approach in promoting and facilitating the transition towards a low carbon and climate resilient economy and in exercising flexibility when adopting international best practices. I think that's very important guidance as to how we want to approach transition. The capital market regulators have also made clear the importance of allowing for a transition and for that transition pathway to be flexible. And all these are actually enshrined in the three key documents on sustainable finance for ASEAN. So on the capital market side, uh, the ASEAN Capital Markets Forum and the Working Committee on Capital Market Development, which oversee uh, the capital markets uh, development, have come together to advance the sustainable finance agenda in the capital markets. As working with industry is actually really, really key, and we can't do this without industry, um, the, the policymakers have actually assembled an industry advisory panel and form working groups within the panel to address the four key pillars, uh, which is the three key pillars, and the one key enabler uh, that I spoke about just now. So there's a working group each on taxonomy, transition, uh, disclosures, and also strengthening demand and supply for sustainable finance. And you can see we have a mix of industry players who are both international, regional, and local, and they also uh, tap their networks to bring the best uh, input to the financial policy makers. The central banks have also been providing a lot of leadership uh, for the banking sector um, in Malaysia. Uh, the Malaysian Central Bank has issued a value-based intermediation financing and investment impact assessment framework. Uh, it has also issued the climate change principles-based taxonomy. It's important I emphasize that it's a principles-based taxonomy uh, for financial institutions and it's had a stock take on the disclosure practices of the different uh, selected financial institutions in Malaysia against the TCFD, and has done gap analysis on the green finance landscape. In Singapore, the Monetary Authority of Singapore has issued a green finance action plan. It's also issued guidelines on environmental risk management for banks, insurance, and asset managers. And the Green Finance Industry Task Force, which is sponsored by the Central Bank, has also consulted on a proposed taxonomy for Singapore-based financial institutions to identify both green and transitional activities. So you see transition plays a really, really uh, big part here. Uh, that particular group, uh, the uh, Green Finance Industry Task Force, um, has also um, um, issued a detailed implementation guide for climate-related disclosures by financial institutions and a framework to help banks assess eligible uh, green trade financing transactions. So there's a lot of work that's been going on. In Indonesia, um, in 2017, the Indonesian Financial Services Authority issued a, a regulation on implementation of sustainable finance for financial services companies, issuers, and public uh, companies as well. And it requires the incorporation of sustainability criteria in banking products and internal risk management systems, uh, disclosure by 2025, also envisages taxonomy. And in the Philippines, the Filipino Central Bank has issued uh, its expectations on the uh, circular, uh, outlining its expectations on the integration of sustainability principles into corporate governance, risk management frameworks, and strategic objectives uh, of banks as well. So there has been a lot of work that's been done. Now, given all this, what's next after COP26? Well, as a prelude to COP26, uh, many ASEAN member states had also announced pledges for emission reduction outcomes reflecting their seriousness towards the climate change agenda. So Brunei, Laos, Vietnam had announced 2050 net zero targets. Malaysia had announced a 2050 carbon neutral target. Uh, Indonesia sales will be a net zero by 2060 and Thailand by 2065. And Singapore said it will face unabated coal by 2050. But many countries actually will require a lot of help and therefore money to achieve their goals. 
And this is where the follow-on from COP26 is actually going to be key. So where do we see ASEAN's focus after COP26? Well, I, I felt it was important to share with you just now where we were going, uh, where we were heading before COP26, because in reality, nothing has changed. COP26 has just served to galvanize uh, the trajectory that ASEAN was heading towards. I mean, I, I would say that the outcomes of COP26 are actually very consistent with ASEAN's goals and trajectory. Um, if we look at the outcomes of COP26, of reducing emissions by 45% by 2030, the methane pledge, deforestation, they're all relevant to ASEAN. And ASEAN has been looking also at how carbon markets can function more effectively and credibly uh, with Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand and Indonesia all having ongoing efforts in, these, in this particular area to varying degrees. But moving on from COP26, ASEAN countries will need to focus on the following. The first is we need to be orienting efforts and capital towards climate goals harder. And it's more important ever uh, than before for us to be able to focus on developing one transition pathway that's credible, but at the same time achievable and for us to mainstream that. Uh, we need to focus on increasing energy efficiency and using more nature-based solutions. We have to strengthen the focus on climate change adaptation. We need to further cross-pillar cooperation. And what I mean by that is actually not just the finance groupings, but also the real economy groupings like the ministries of agriculture, the ministries of uh, industry, the ministries of energy. We need to work more and more with them to ensure that we have a holistic approach towards transition. And importantly, we have to enable private sector funding pledges to be able to reach us because I think, as I said, money is something that's very important. Uh, the private uh, sector actually uh, caused this problem uh, with the climate and it's the private sector that's actually going to fix it up. So I hope that uh, this brief introduction to ASEAN uh, has been useful to you and I'd be looking forward to discuss more on ASEAN with you later on. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Mr. Wong, for that uh, wonderful presentation. It was wonderful to have you here with us online. And now, ladies and gentlemen, today's speeches were so engaging, uh, as were the presenters, that it's now time for our first panel discussion. So my colleagues are here rearranging the stage. And... Uh, Okay, well, it's, it, th I mean, if this was to take a long time, this would normally be where I do my song and dance routine, but I will spare you from that today. Um, the panel discussion will be moderated by Mr. Balaj Shoshwadi, Senior Researcher at the Sustainable Finance Department of the MNB, the Central Bank of Hungary. So, if we are all ready, Mr. Shoshwadi, the floor is yours. And uh, thanks a lot for you to, uh, for being here today and sharing your thoughts regarding EU taxonomy and also regarding the lessons of, of uh, COP26 and also your experiences. I would like to continue now with the same topics but in a more interactive format. Uh, but before to join to our discussion, I would like to very shortly emphasize the second pillar of the green program of the Central Bank of Hungary, which focuses on educational and research activities. Um, this is highly relevant and this is on our agenda since we do believe that the green program's success cannot miss to rely on exceptional experts. And for gaining these exceptional experts, um, we have to embed these thoughts into the university curricula and um, also to boost high-level advanced researches. And regarding researches, the term interdisciplinarity is highly relevant because we do believe that no single scientific method can answer the questions of sustainability. Well, actually, I also belong to this academic program of the team, uh, but I also highlight this case because I noticed that scientific background, scientific argumentation is also belonging to your key message. So I would like to set it as a common point for this discussion. And uh, with this in our mind, I would like to turn first to Eugene Wong, uh, and I prepared a few quotes uh, for him. 
Actually, we already heard regional and uh, national level aspects of the ASEAN. And uh, Eugene Wong has uh, a mantra how he defines it. And this is perfect just isn't good enough. Well, he says that it fits more the ASEAN than any other region in the world. And um, if we think about the economic diversity, social diversity, and also the cultural one, uh, we may fi argument, find arguments for that. By this he means, and the quote again, the quest for perfect will stop us from making those changes that we can make right now. On one side, I think this is quite convincing. Um, and we can maybe agree that there is no one size it fit all for the ASEAN. But on the other side, it keeps a bias on the agenda. So my question to Eugene is, uh, do you think that this is a relevant target to prepare the member states to be ready for a unified program? What steps and what time is needed to achieve that? Um, you're quite right. Uh, that's why I meant uh, the Green Club cannot be an exclusive club based on the highest ambition because, you know, as I said just now, you can't really flick a switch and turn green overnight. And that's the same with any, you know, al alignment with uh, any sustainability aspect. There are many people who want to contribute to this effort but are constrained by, say, existing physical or economic structures. And they're prepared to contribute to the agenda, but they're not able to go all the way. For example, if we target tailpipe emissions at 50 grams uh, per kilometer, not many people may be able to achieve this in an emerging market because of either techno technological viability or, or economic viability or both. Um, but what happens then? So they give up. Uh, but if they could achieve 100 grams per kilometer, which is much better than 200 grams they are doing today, uh, why not? So. Of course, the proviso is that this avenue doesn't result in a lock-in of inefficient technologies and the good, uh, so-called good, is not an excuse for not adopting a more achievable, perfect, or moving towards the highest ambition. I'll give you an example. Uh, when we started with the ASEAN Green Bond Standards, we went for the highest standard possible. We said no fossil fuels will be allowed and people were actually uh, quite amazed we did that. Uh, but we also knew uh, deep down inside we had to find a way to allow those who could not achieve this level of greenness to also do something meaningful. And pending coming up with a specific framework for this good as opposed to the perfect, we felt that we could use the ASEAN social bonds uh, standards uh, in many situations. But now what we want to do, having gone through that process um, and having achieved a certain level of uh, confidence is that we want to mainstream credible transition, and that's a very important statement. We want to mainstream credible transition. And that's why if you look at the ASEAN taxonomy, which I urge all of you to have a sneak peek at, um, the ASEAN taxonomy has a principles-based foundation framework uh, that doesn't have any metrics and thresholds, and a plus standard that has tiers with metrics and thresholds. The foundation framework will allow everyone who wants to commit to achieving uh, some or starting their, their sustainability journey uh, to, to actually get on board. And the tiers of the PLUS standard will allow parties to commit to achieving continuous improvement that can be quantitatively measured. So this means there are no more excuses. Everyone has a pathway that they can adopt. Uh, we've seen how sustainability linked loans and sustainability linked bonds are starting to encourage the transition journey. And the argument that we must help brown companies who want to do better uh, is actually very valid. But there will be concerns, of course, of greenwashing, but that doesn't mean we should abandon such efforts, but we should see how to make them more effective. Uh, more real targets, um, no excuse to delay genuine progress, science-based uh, uh, measures and meaningful trajectories. These are all really important. It's also important to make sure that penalties really have teeth and targets aren't too easy. Um, and you, you can't avoid, you just have to really try and push transition. And as I shared earlier, uh, ASEAN's cooperative structure means that every member state determines its own direction, but the ASEAN taxonomy is an overarching guide and common language for all our member states. It's reflecting our common ambition. So to your question, will all our member states use this taxonomy as a sole taxonomy for, for the whole of ASEAN? Well, we hope that'll be the case eventually, but for now we need to understand that every member state may need their own national taxonomies to address their national agendas. But importantly, um, 
we have to make sure that all these national taxonomies are heading the same direction right now. Market forces, particularly international money, is a key driver for taxonomy convergence. We've seen that in the accounting standards. But given the different stages of development of our member states, we cannot force square pegs into round holes. But what we can do is to provide different holes on the same platform for them to fit in. At least we know everyone's on the same platform. We know what that platform is about. And this is how the ASEAN taxonomy is designed. So I'll just stop here for now. Thank you. Thanks for your answer. And um, well, I think that uh, to see the experiences of the ASEAN can have uh, significant lessons also for our region. And with um, such regional related question, I would like to turn now to Bernard. And um, as we heard that in the ASEAN, there is no one size fit all, but um, would, that, would that be the case also for our region? And uh, what do you think, what role can in this game play our regional differences and also the differences regarding issuer types if we look on the market as a whole? Well, as a scientist, well, coming from a research institute and as a physicist, I would always answer, it depends. Um, because it always depends. It depends on the context of the issue, as I mentioned in the presentation. It depends on the regional context. Um, it depends on many factors. And one could always think back on like what we originally thought was green, and it was like solar rooftops. That's conceivably green but it often gets more complex. And what we want to have is we want to incentivize a race to the top. So we want issuers to move ambitiously and to go beyond what they have to do, um, either by a regulation or by, by, let's say, a certain minimum baseline. And so while the, the taxonomification of the different regions leads to of course, a common understanding, a common language that talks about very important aspects like technical screening criteria, do no significant harm elements. All of these elements were not commonly discussed before. And suddenly, we have them all commonly discussed, be it in the Asians or be it here in the region. And that's very welcome. What we as a second opinion provider and part of a research institute, however, always see is that it depends, again, on the interpretation of a single issuer, how they apply to their own assets, to their own infrastructure, to their own strategies, and how they actually draw that cutoff line, how it compares to peers, and if they are eventually ambitious or not, depends really on too many factors to say that a one size fit all would fit all. Thanks a lot for pointing on the different uh, interests of different actors. And actually, such bias, I think, uh, appears on many platforms. One uh, is a very recent issue regarding the EU taxonomy. So now I would like to turn to Nathan Fabian with this topic. Um, there was a proposal recently to uh, bring uh, nuclear power and also natural gas to the blocks, uh, green finance taxonomy. So this proposal is on one side, but on the other side, we heard words like it's a scientific disgrace. How would you evaluate uh, the outcome and also the impact of the debate itself? Uh, thank you. So well, we haven't seen the outcome yet. It's still being debated. Uh, I think the point is that there is a need in markets for some objective framework that can be relied upon. and. It's descriptive only. It's not a decision-making framework. You have to use it as part of another decision. So for it to be useful in the market, it has to be as accurate as possible, noting that our understanding of the environmental objectives will change over time and our progress. So we should just be clear that when we put emissions into the atmosphere, it contributes to climate change. Uh, it is not reducing the level of emissions marginally uh, does not stop global warming. It just contributes a little bit less. That's just an objective fact. And if we can't say that in our comparative framework, we're not going to make it. We're not going to be able to make the decisions we need to. So that's, this is the issue, I think, on, on the, the, uh, the gas side. On nuclear, it's really clear. It's, it's near to zero carbon, apart from some embodied emissions but there's a waste problem. So it's perfectly green for climate mitigation, 
but there's a pollution and a but potentially an ecosystem or a biodiversity risk depending on how the waste is managed or there's an, a, a physical event. We need to be able to say that objectively and then countries need to be able to make their own energy policy around that. French citizens will tolerate nuclear power. French investors will tolerate nuclear power. German investors and citizens will not. Frankly, that's a matter for them. What's important is that we have an objective assessment of what the condition is around these technologies so that we can make sensible decisions. Might I add one more point just to pick up Eugene's comments, which I think are excellent because inclusivity is essential. But I would encourage all regions of the world, whether it's a plus taxonomy or the base tool, to be clear what is the environmental objective, what is the, what is the target that sits behind it, can we please use lists of economic activities that can connect to each other, even if they're different lists, but at least they can be compared. And then ultimately, we will need some performance criteria that describe our progress towards meeting those targets. And this is important. Inclusivity is important, but scale and speed is also important. And therefore, we need tools that help us achieve that. Thanks a lot for your insights, which belong to the whole community level and it reaches out to many other platforms. For example, the, the concrete case what you, Gergely Pokos, already mentioned today that uh, OTP Bank is the first Hungarian lender who signed the UN principles for responsible banking. And some may think from distance that after uh, signing such paper, it does not need more steps than just to adopt those regulations and to follow the recommendations from a paper. But I guess that the concrete case is quite different from that. So I would like to shed light, uh, I would like you to uh, shed light on uh, what are the concrete steps that a single bank has to do after that and some concrete steps from the OTP bank as well. Thank you for uh, highlighting again that uh, OTP is the first Hungarian bank to, uh, to join this uh, UN initiative. We can not, never, uh, never have enough publicity around this. Um, I mean, as, as, as with, with any public declaration or, or signing of initiative or, or anything like this, uh, there is a PR element to it, uh, no question about it. I mean, we are communicating it to our investors and, and stakeholders. And that in itself um, is, is not only for PR for PR's sake, it's also to, uh, to show our commitment towards our targets, to show our commitment to, to what we want to do. Because uh, once you, uh, you commit to something publicly, it's, uh, it's much different to, to walk away from it. But coming to your question about uh, what is actually uh, required, uh, once you sign the declaration, you have to pay a fee. It's not high. That that's you, you sign, you pay. That's about that's about it. And then, uh, very practically, for 18 months, not much needs to happen on paper, because fundamentally, what you agree to is that uh, uh, you take some time off to think about uh, the targets that you want to achieve, to evaluate your portfolio, evaluate your operation, set a baseline for yourself, measure your targets against that baseline, and then. Uh, put out an action plan. And then you need to disclose uh, the first time your, your targets and, and your action plan, and then yearly you need to disclose in a certain format of what you, what you, uh, what you need to do. So that, that is it in its essence. And by the way, um, we have made a conscious decision to join the PRB, but uh, there are many initiatives out there. Um, there is Net Zero Coalition and this and that, um, I don't want to say they're all the same, they all serve a specific purpose, but the, the, the fundamental uh, structure of what you need to do is pretty similar everywhere. So you join, you draw a baseline, you make some commitments, and then you have a, a roadmap towards that. Now, we have found it very, um, very helpful after we joined the PRB that, uh, first of all, we have a platform for disclosures other than, than what we come up with ourselves and, and what we do co together with the Central Bank of Hungary. Uh, this, is, this will be our platform for, uh, for our official disclosures regarding our sustainability efforts um, towards the public at large, towards our investors, towards the UN and so on. So, so that said, that's fixed, it's one less thing to worry about. Number two, you get a lot of support 
after you join such a, such an initiative. Again, you get a lot of support from the UN from our, in our case, but all the others will also provide you support in how to do the baseline. There's a lot of discussion about methodology and this and that. Um, and, uh, and last but not least, coming back to my original point, it, uh, it gives you a platform to, uh, to, uh, to, to make your commitments last, to make your commitments stick. And, uh, and I, would, I would really encourage everyone who has not yet uh, joined one or other uh, um, you know, platform or community like this to strongly consider it, because apart from the PR, it does have very practical benefits. Uh, for your institution. Thanks a lot. Actually, our time for the panel was already when it was planned limited, and uh, during the day it became even more limited. So now I would like to just a very short question, a unified one, to give to all of you. And for that, I would like to quote again from Eugene, who first uh, many times referred to his activities in green finance as a journey. And once when he was asked uh, that what is the most relevant shift he achieved in his career, he answered that uh, his mother talks about climate change. Um, actually, even if this is on the top of the list, I guess that the list is uh, very long in all your case. I would like to ask, and first Eugene, that uh, what is the next milestone that you would like to achieve? Well, we, we think of, you know, I, I want to come back to this about the journey, and it's a journey because uh, sustainability is a journey because it's dependent on both internal and external circumstances, and these circumstances are constantly shifting. So what's important is for us to create an ecosystem that's alive and able to adapt. Um, and for me, that ecosystem actually comprises of the three pillars we talked about, taxonomy, uh, transition standard, and disclosure right now. Uh, we've already uh, started work hosting the taxonomy board. Uh, we are working on the transition platform that came hand to hand with the, um, with the taxonomy work. And also we are working on disclosures. Uh, so I'd like to actually see the three pillars coming fully to life, supporting the ecosystem and enabling the real economy to connect with the financial sector. That's the first. Uh, and of course, for that, we need to build the ecosystem. The next is, of course, putting cars on the road. We can build the ecosystem all we want, but we need the transactions to happen. So we want to actually build more coalitions to move the capital, because without moving the capital, everything else is useless. And just a very quick example, uh, one of the coalitions we built is uh, a, a European fund manager who wanted to export a model to finance one of the SDGs successfully implemented in Europe. But of course, the distribution channel is different in, in Southeast Asia, so we brought um, a fintech company to work with them. The fintech company had licenses, uh, it was low cost and had deep penetration. And now they're working together to implement a platform to uh, help to orient capital. So this is, again, something we want to do. We actually want to build more coalitions and collaborations to move the capital. Thanks a lot. Bernard, what is your next milestone? I can only second that. Um, you know, the, the activity of this whole discussion, that is a, a milestone that we have to reach, that the taxonomy is made practical, that we scale the market, that it becomes difficult, really difficult, to get financing if you're not green, because green becomes mainstream. That would be the next step that we're all trying to achieve, I think. Thank you, Nathan, just to keep the order of the first round. So my l next milestone actually happened for me yesterday. So I'm going to show, because I think we are moving very quickly now. I saw some Goldman Sachs analysis of risk premiums on fossil fuel based energy models with long tenor payback periods relative to renewable and clean assets. And the risk premium had been hovering around sort of 8 to 12 percent in relatively equal numbers for both technologies for, for a long time. And then in the last year, we saw the data that risk premiums have shifted. And so any fossil based long tenor payback periods are now requiring 20 percent risk premium, and renewable projects are requiring 5 to 6 percent. And so we have seen the market adjust. And the market's doing this not by discounting cash flows, it's by starting to look at forward transition trajectories and which market the, the tail end of these asset lives are going to be operating in and they can see it doesn't add up anymore. So the goals are starting to bite. So it's, it's goals, 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 goals. Incl include those in your activities and you'll start to make the right decisions. Thanks a lot. It became an announcement. And Gergely, what is your... 
So I, I, I can second everything that was said before me. I just want to close with um, Eugene said uh, his mother is talking about climate change. I have two small daughters. They came home from school last week and they told me that uh, they learned about climate change and now they understand what I do at work all day. So I think that that's the biggest transition they will ever face. Thank you. Thanks a lot for your thoughts and, uh, and for being here today. I'm, I'm really sure that everybody in the audience could collect a lot of takeaways today. So I just really hope that the latest in one year time we will meet here again. Thanks a lot again. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Wong, Mr. Schiesel, Mr. Fabian, Mr. Porkers, and of course, Mr. Shoshvari. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we will now be taking a short coffee break, 20 minutes. Coffee will be served in the central area outside, and we look forward to having you back here at 11.45. Thank you, and enjoy your coffee. Ladies and gentlemen, actually, very frank, frankly speaking, this is the best part of my day, to give uh, something special to uh, excellent uh, players. So in, 19, in, in 2019, uh, the Central Bank of Hungary has started a tradition uh, as we initiated the Green Finance uh, Awards to recognize the most environmentally conscious financial service providers. We strongly believe that we need positive feedback for those most advanced in this field and to recognize the best achievements. This way, we can also provide inspiration and encouragement for the whole Hungarian financial sector. This year, the winners of the Green Financial Awards have been determined by a number of quantifiable indicators to assess the greenness of finance, uh, financial institutions' activities. In this year, uh, the award will be granted in three categories. The Green Bank Award, the Green Insurance and Pension Fund Award, and the Green Investment Fund Manager Award. In case of banks, the metrics determining the winners were based on the green lending activity and the carbon intensity, intensity of the loan books. In case of the insurance companies, pension funds, and the investment funds managers, the criteria relies on uh, the manage, managed ESG or green funds. All of the awarded institutions have shown dedication to green finance in their activities, performing as the greenest institutions in their own sector. I personally congratulate all of the winners and let's see who are they. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deputy, Con uh, Deputy Governor Kondrach. Yes, and if I can ask you to stay with us to present the awards. Ladies and gentlemen, the first category is the Green Bank Award. And the winner of the award is MKB Bank Enyerte, a part of the Hungarian Bank Holding. Receiving the award is Mr. Andras Puskás, Deputy CEO of the Hungarian Bank Holding. Mr. Puskás has already made his way onto the stage to accept the award. His Excellency, the Deputy Governor of the National Bank, Mr. Kondrac, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor for me to stand here to receive this award. I'm very proud of the sustainability aspirations of the MKB Bank, convinced the Hungarian National Bank that our future building is progressing very successfully. 
As a Hungarian-owned bank, we have a great responsibility to support sustainable and green developments in the region, because these can guarantee the welcome future for the next generation. The MKB would show an example to the other members and companies of the market with its amenable work ethics, even decreasing carbon footprint. This ongoing progress started in 2018 when MKB started its sustainable operations program. Then in July 2020, set up an expert group with the goal to create a climate and sustainability strategy. The management in December 2020 accepted the document. The sustainable aspirations can be divided into two groups. First of all, MKB would, uh, would like to be a partner of the National Bank and the other market players in green finances, develop ESG-based products and services, support sustainable investments. And on the other hand, it decided to recognize its own operation to be a more environmental conscious company. It's my honor to receive this award uh, in, in the name of the MKB Group and the Magyar Bank Holding. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Pushkash, and congratulations on the award to yourself and your bank. Ladies and gentlemen, coming up now is the Green Insurance and Pension Fund Award which has been awarded to Union Vienna Insurance Group, Pistoshito ZRT. Accepting the award is Ms. Gabriela Olmashi, CEO of the company. Ms. Olmashi, please make your way to the stage. Thank you to receive the award. Thank you, thank you for it. Uh, it is very important for, for our company. Uh, and it is a source of a, a great uh, pride for us that uh, our efforts uh, on, the, on the field of uh, sustainability is, uh, or are, uh, are, are uh, highly appreciated by the uh, Hungarian National Bank. Uh, I think that uh, Union Vistosito aims to contribute to to uh, building uh, a new new future, uh, more responsible, uh, a greener future. Uh, but I think that it is important that it is all all level on all level uh, levels uh, in our company. As uh, Mr. Kandrach uh, mentioned today morning, it is important that in the mindset, in the in the all of in activities, all of uh, in decisions, uh, the sustainability is uh, presented. So. Uh, all, for example, uh, for all of our insurance products uh, is uh, fully, fully digital, uh, fully paperless currently. Uh, not only the climate change is issues are important, so uh, the climate change issues uh, are our core business, as you know, so it is not a, a, a big uh, question. But uh, on, the, on the other fields, uh, we, we do uh, more. Uh, I think uh, significantly more. So for all of all of the areas that is that are uh, related to the sustainability is important for us. So we are very happy on it, and thank you for this uh, prize. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Almashi, and congratulations on the award. And ladies and gentlemen, the next award is the Green Investment Fund Manager Award. The institution receiving the award is the Erste Alapkezelő ZRT. So I'd like to ask Dr. György Mesterházi, CEO of the company, to come to the stage to accept the award.
thank you for nominating and also just selecting Ernst Asset Management. And to save some paper, I use my mobile. Um, it's a great honor to be the green asset management company of the year in 2021 here in Budapest, Hungary. And also thanks for the opportunity to share some words and thoughts of asset management in the field of sustainable, responsible investment here. Uh, sustainability means that actions of today's generation should not limit the opportunities of the future one. And to ensure this principle, sustainability is a great part of our investment process. And it reflects not only an economic uh, prospect, but also an ESG, economic, uh, environmental, social, and governance aspect. Uh, to ensure and uh, also to validate those principles, as the asset management signed the principles for responsible investment, the so-called PRI, in 2009. Later on, we introduced some other guidelines on minimal ethical standards. And due to those guidelines, we are excluded from our investment universe, those companies which are involved in the production or sale of banned weapons, coal mining, or even coal-fired power generation. After that, we also introduced the ban on any food price speculation in our investment funds. Uh, we are convinced that such an, uh, uh, such an uh, aspect of sustainable investment policy uh, not just marks a positive contribution to our society, but also leads to an attractive medium and long-term return of our investment funds, and also to the reduction of several risk factors. Our long-term commitment is proven by the fact that we launched our first sustainable investment funds more than 20 years ago, back in 2001 in Austria. 20 years later, today in Hungary, Erste Asset Management manages seven ESG funds oh, with total asset under management more than 30 billion forints, and it's increasing day by day. I think with this more than 20 years experience in the field of ESG investments, we are absolutely committed towards sustainable, responsible investment, and that's why we are happy to receive this award. It means a lot to our company. It shows that we are on a good track. Thank you again for this. Thank you, Dr. Mustad Hazi, and congratulations on the award. And now, ladies and <coughs> pardon me, with this we close the Green Finance Awards to financial institutions, and we now turn to Green Finance Scientific Awards. And before I ask uh, Deputy Governor Kondrash uh, to tell us about these awards, let me just tell you that the winners of the awards have been decided by, uh, by on a high level, with a high level jury, invoking both uh, the MMB and composed of outstanding scientific experts and members of MMB's Monetary Council. Now the jury members are Gyurgy Motolci, Governor of the MMB, Urs Sotmari, Chairman of the Sustainable Development Committee of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, Csaba Kondrac, Deputy Governor of NMB, Gyurgy Kozitsky, Member of the MMB's Monetary Council, Gustav Bager, former member of the MMB's Monetary Council, Diana Urga Vorsatz, Vice Chair of the Working Group 3 of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, Chopa Kurdoshi, Head of the Sustainability Directorate of the Office of the President of Hungary, and Mr. Peter Koderiak, Head of the Zero Carbon Center. And now, once again, I We'll hand the floor over to Deputy Governor Kondrash to introduce this new initiative to us. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. It's another honor uh, because uh, we established a new initiative, a new award, and uh, this is, I think, 100% uh, uh, highlighted that uh, if you are a creative central bank, uh, what kind of tools you have to facilitate uh, the green uh, change and the green transformation 
because Green Finance is a very young platform in the Hungarian academic research. So by founding these new awards, our aim was to support researchers and provide an incentive for scholars to find new ways enhancing sustainability. As a symbol of our dedication to these goals, we plan to present these awards annually. The main profile, profile of these awards is green finance, but I would like to also highlight the interdisciplinary aspect. Sustainability cannot rely on only financial tools, thus the following researchers and research projects also demonstrate various approaches. I sincerely hope that our awards will serve an inspiration for the whole green finance research community and that we are contributing to the development of education and science related to sustainable finance with our initiatives. And now, let's see the winners. Thank you very much, Mr. Kondach. So, let's see this year's winners category by category. The first category is the International Green Finance Lifetime Achievement Scientific Award. And the winner of this year's award is Dr. Naoki Yoshino. Dr. Yoshino is Professor Emeritus at Keio University, Tokyo, Japan and until March 2020 was Dean of the Asian Development Bank Institute. He obtained his PhD from John Hopkins University in 1979. In 2004, he was named Director of the Japanese Financial Services Agency's Financial Research Center, the FSA Institute, and is now its Chief Advisor. He has served as chairperson of the Japanese Ministry of Finance's Council of Foreign Exchange, as well as its Fiscal System Council. Additionally, he has been a board member of the Deposit Insurance Corporation of Japan and president of the Financial System Council of the Government of Japan. He was nominated for inclusion in the Who's Who of the World for 2009 and 2013 and was named one of the top 100 educators in 2009. He obtained his honorary doctorates from the University of Gothenburg in 2004 and from the Martin Luther University of Halle Wittenberg in 2013. He has also received the Fukuzawa Award in 2013 for his contribution to research on economic policy. And now I would like to ask Dr. Yoshino to accept his award and give his presentation. Thank you very much for providing such a splendid award. And this is the first time award. And I wish uh, many, many people will succeed my uh, next year. Today, I would like to talk about several topics in what I have been doing in the field of green finance. And today, I would like to talk about two main issues. First one is current green finance is very important, but one more step will be needed. Second one is in this morning we are discussing mainly developed nations, but we should include developing countries into green finance. So in the latter part, I would like to talk about how to develop green finance and green technologies in both developed and developing countries. SDG, ESG, greenness, all of them are very important topic in these days. However, when we look at the green indicators, each rating agency has different definition and different criteria. Some of the rating agency will look at whether the top senior managers 
are concerned about greenness and the environment. So they score each company based on the management concern. Another rating agency will look at disclosure booklet. How many pages each company will discuss about environment and green issues? And another rating agency look at exposure of greenhouse gases and so on. So in other words, this is a seven example of uh, rating agencies. And then you can see all of them have a different definition of environment and greenness. So this means, and also we all have a region by region, the definitions are different. Everybody aware greenness and the environments are important. However, they are how to measure those ESG score and greenness scores diverge from rating agency to another. So the first point is we need one more head. And traditionally, investors were looking at rate of return and risk. This was a traditional approach. And William Sharp and Markowitz, very famous portfolio analysis, they are talking about rate of return and risk. Now we have to pay attention to greenness or ESG or SDG. Sorry, I have to use equations, but don't worry about equations. We often use rate of return and risk. So those are the two angle analysis. And nowadays, we have to pay attention to ESG, not only rate of return and risk. So if we write diagrammatically, traditional investment are focusing on two angles, rate of return and risk. Then we achieved the optimal portfolio allocation. This was the traditional investor allocation, banks, insurance companies, and pension funds. Now we need third angle in the top, ESG. However, we have seen those definitions are different from one rating agency to another. Then what will happen in this portfolio analysis? Then this is the current situation of the portfolio allocation. Traditionally, we are looking at point E without taking into account of ESG or greenness. However, if we look at the ESG score on the vertical axis or green score, then depending on the rating agency, that evaluation of company, two companies are different. Some rating agency evaluate by black line on the vertical axis. Another rating agency defines by blue a green line. Then if you map it into the bottom, then portfolio allocation will be different based on which rating agency the investors will ask. So this means we need one more head to talk about ESG or greenness. If we look at the three cases, left-hand side is the portfolio allocation. You can see 0.57. That is the portfolio between a and B, two assets. 57% goes to com company A, and 43% goes to company B. Then depending on three rating agencies, when I use the scores of ESG, then 71 based on rating agency one. And rating agency two, 0 0.74. That means 74% should be invested in company A, and 26% should be invested in company B. And let's look at the third rating agency, 0.54. 54% goes to company A, 46% should be coming to company B. So you can see, depending on the rating agency, then the advices are different. So that means we have to have identify two things would be needed. One way is to charge tax on CO2 or plastics exposures, or NOx, identically the same tax rate. Then after tax rate of return, will be automatically reduces return and some risk. Then we can have dotted line after the tax on CO2 or NOx or plastics. The first one is taxing waste. 
identically to all over the world, then investors can look at rate of return and risk without taking into account of greenness or ESG, because tax is automatically adjusted. Suppose 2050 is the goal, then we can change the tax rate depend based on the progress of the reduction of CO2 and GHG gases. So this could be the best solution in order to achieve optimal portfolio allocation, because investors can come back to rate of return and risk. However, internationally, globally, both developed and developing countries, same tax rate for CO2, NOx, plastics, those are very difficult. So theoretically, this is one of the ways. And then, how about the GHG gases and so on? Recently, we can use satellite photos in Japan, and we can identify each company, how much CO2 they're exposing, and also each household, how much CO2 they're exposing. And satellite photo will tell whether they have a rooftop or solar power or not. And based on these satellite photos, we can identify companies and individuals based on their exposures. So it is possible to detect how much GHG gases has been exposed, not only companies, but also households. So that is one way in order to bring back to risk and return profile. And second best one is the unique and credit rating of green bond. Currently, green bond is based on about 10 criteria. Some of the green bonds, 99% green, and some other green bond, 70% green. And both of them can be issued green bond. And that is happening in Japan too. So some of the housing, which has a solar power and a generator, then they can issue green bond in order to finance. But uh, those housing may be 80% green, 20% gray, 70% green, 30% gray. All of them is allowed to issue green bond. Then we need one more step. We have to measure clear greenness. And based on those greenness, we should evaluate credit rating for green bond. And that can bring better allocation for each investors and individuals. And also next, uh, greenness consciousness are different from one country to another. When I looked at the uh, Asian countries, left-hand side, you can see the red line. Japan uh, indicated 120, Korea 104, then Malaysia 57, Indonesia 44, Philippines 39. Green consciousness are also different from one country to another. And this is very important to achieve higher green consciousness, not only developed countries, but also the developing nations. Otherwise, green at 2050 target cannot be achieved. Next, I would like to talk about uh, green banking and green central bank. Currently, I was talking about green bond has been issued a lot based on 10 green bond principles. But as I said, one more step will be needed. It is better to have credit rating for each bond, whether its greenness is 100% or 70% or 60%. Then green banking can also allocate their loans based on their green credit rating. And these green credit rating has to be unified in globally or by nations. Otherwise, green banks, banks will distort their allocations. And same thing can be applied green central bank. Central bank used to purchase ordinary government bond. And now, many central bank is now focusing on to purchase green bond. But uh, greenness criteria and greenness indicators has to be clearly defined Otherwise, also the monetary policy, then all the bonds has been purchased, simply it is called green bond, then that will misallocation of the fund. 
So my first fine point is we need one more step. Greenness, green ESG, and those are very important. However, clear green credit rating will be one more step we need it. And that can bring the better portfolio allocation on financial institutions and central bank. Second part, I'd like to talk about the Asia and developing countries, and both developed and developing countries can bring much more private sector finance into green energy. There are two kinds of green energies in many regions, especially in Asia. First one is a big hydro project, big dam. This is a clean energy. And second one is a community-based green energy, like solar power or green uh, power. And those are the community-based. And both of them, we need private sector finance because COVID-19 brought fiscal deficits in many countries, including Asian countries. Then government alone cannot satisfy those green investment. We have to bring private sector finance into green field. However, bringing private sector finance, we often call it PPP, public-private partnerships. And both public sector and private sector will invest into infrastructure or green infrastructure. However, in Asia and Latin America, many of these PPP had failed because there are conflicts between users and private investors in traditional PPP. Suppose in the middle is a green infrastructure. Then users prefer low electricity price. And investors prefer high rate of return. Then how could we match both users and private investors? That is the reason why PPP failed in many countries, many regions. Users prefer low fee, and private investors prefer high rate of return. And if private investors prefer high rate of return, then user fees has to be increased. So that is a conflict between the two. Then we have to bring another return for investors from somewhere by keeping users of electricity, green energy, low price, but private investors can achieve higher rate of return. How could it be possible to bring in this black line to the red line by bringing some revenue to this green infrastructure? In Asian region, the hydroelectric power is now under construction in Mekong region. In this uh, electricity supply, then the city along this electricity supply can set up their new businesses. Agricultural farmers can use their tractors, and commercial building can be constructed. New residential area will be constructed. So green energy can bring big spillover effects into the region. And we can compute how much tax revenues had been created by those spillover effects by electricity supply. Corporate tax, income tax, sales tax, property tax. Then we can measure how much it has been increased. Traditionally, those spillover tax revenues used to be returned to the government, and they were not returned to infrastructure investors. If we can compute those extra uh, additional tax revenues created by electricity supply by green power, then we can return part of those spillover tax revenues to investors. Then the rate of return of investors will increase and keeping the user charges very low. That can attract banks, insurance, pension funds, and so on. So this will increase the rate of return for all private investors, and that can achieve PPP, public-private partnerships. And this is quite important in order to accelerate green power into Asian region, because we are facing with big COVID-19 and fiscal deficits. 
Last one is a community-based green power. And community-based green power, we need money from small investors, small uh, depositors in the region, and then contribute small amount of money to construct solar power, wind power, and so on. This is one of the example which we developed in Japan, so wind power. Then small investors or individuals contribute small amount of money, and then they constructed wind power into the village. Then the village can supply those power to the people. And solar power panel was constructed in Laos. Then Laos people, they are not so rich yet, but the 250 people contributed small amount of money. And then the solar power had been constructed into the village and they can supply electricity at night and farmers can use tractors and so on. So these are the community-based uh, green energy. And lots of green power has been constructed in Japan, collecting money from individuals in the region. So I think there are two kinds of ways to finance green infrastructure. One is big one, by returning spillover tax revenues to investors, and then bringing the rate of return is higher, and keeping users very low price. And second one is community-based uh, electricity supply. And uh, one, one village in Japan with use very small river, then electricity generator can provide those electricity to those villages and remote area. So I think uh, there are lots of things we have to do, both in advanced nations and developing nations, but hopefully we can achieve the green economy by 2050 and including developed countries and developing countries. And thank you very much for an uh, excellent award to provide it to me. And I would like to continue my green finance research as much as I could. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Yoshino, and congratulations on the award. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the second category is the Green Finance Scientific Grand Award. The winner of the award is Dr. Helena Noffer. Helena Noffer's outstanding publishing activity serves as an example for the Hungarian research community in several areas of green financial research. As an instructor, she is a popular lecturer in several subjects. Her work embodies a practice-oriented approach based on theory, and she has gained extensive experience both in the academic scene and in market decision-making. So, Dr. Noffa, please make your way to the stage to receive the award. And congratulations on the award. The next award on the agenda is the Green Finance Talent Award. The award goes to Ms. Kota Molnar. The special value of Kota Molnar's research activity, among others, is her international and project-based approach. The extensive water risk analysis of water management and climate adaptation as well as of investment portfolios and economic sectors, calls our attention to one of the most pressing areas of environmental risk management. Ms. Molnar, please make your way to the stage to accept your award. Congratulations, Ms. Morna. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the award for new research initiative in green finance goes to Dr. Anet Poradi Dolgos and her research group. 
In the research plan developed by the research group on the topic of green finance solutions that can be adapted to the specific challenges of Hungarian agriculture, there is an opportunity to have a direct and serious impact on the Hungarian economy and banking system in terms of sustainability. Thank you to Dr. Onet Paradi Dolgos, Dr. Arnold Chonka, and Dr. Tibor Bayrat. Other members of the research group include Professor, Professor Sándor Kerekes and László Vonchura. And now I would like to ask Dr. Onet Poradi Dolgos to please make her way to the stage and accept the award. Congratulations on the award and thank you, Deputy Governor Kondrach, for presenting all the awards. Congratulations to all our winners and all we can say um, at the Central Bank of Hungary is just keep up the good work on green transformation. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we are taking a lunch break. We look forward to seeing you back here at two o'clock this afternoon as our conference continues. Until then, it's bon appetit. Now we would like to continue the conference by devoting a special section to the most important global banking sustainability initial initiative, the United Nations Principles for Responsible Banking. Now, the Central Bank of Hungary is an official endorser of this international initiative, encouraging Hungarian banks to become signatories. So, let us now watch what is happening in this area around the globe and in Hungary too, as well as some other videos about how green finance is evolving in Hungary. COVID has really taught the world that we need to listen to everyone. This movement is showing the world that you can do good and you can be a good entity that's supporting good communities and still be financially sustainable. Since the COVID came in, overall we say that we see activities subdued. Uh, our performance has been driven by loans. Growth has been quite challenged. We've had to restructure a lot of our customer service challenges in all, in, in all sectors, from hospitality, transport, tourism, schools, and many others. It's very important that th those companies receive not just the working capital they need for the recovery phase, but also the investments they need to make to be more productive. It is our job in this, in this group to focus on listening to our customers and diagnosing the situation and being able to provide an equitable and fair solution. Being a signatory of the principles for responsible banking gives us a framework on how we can help going through these times and, and help through the recoveries. De ser firmante de los principios y poder demostrarle a los clientes que hay mucha consistencia entre lo que hacemos y lo que decimos es una it's an opportunity very valuable for the bank and for its clients. Under the COVID Emergency Fund program, which was set up by, you know, in March, one of the biggest realizations when the fund was set up was how, what is the impact for economic impact for communities and livelihoods. So you think of the payment protection plan. Banks were notified, and within a few days, we had to build a portal, create it, and manage it, and process it. We did, we did all of that over one weekend. With the principles of, of, of responsible banking, how we, through financial inclusion, putting in service our digital platforms could make the difference, not helping people to save, but also allowing them to access credit in a different way. Pues, sencillamente, sin, sin, si el banco no hubiese actuado de la forma que ha actuado, saliendo a tiempo, oportuna y con con las acciones adecuadas muchas de estas compañías ya hoy no existirían. I cannot tell you how many nights I sat here just hearing the gratitude of folks who didn't know where their next day was going to be. We need to focus on every client 
in every walk of life and every small business and have everyone have an equitable seat at the table in order to really effectively support our economy. I truly believe that the next 30 years of our economy, of our society, can't be like the last 30 years. How many crises do we need um, before we start reacting? Sustainability uh, means survival uh, in the long run for every institution. I don't see a world doing business or a bank doing business in the future without considering the importance of sustainability. The answer is very straightforward and simple. You can't change anything unless you change yourself. You have to share the same values and strategies to be able to do the business that you're doing. If we want to achieve society's goals, we need to think beyond traditional banking. This movement is showing the world that you can be a good entity that's supporting good communities and still be financially sustainable. There's actually real power in working with each other to support each other, to drive change together. What we have done is to identify seven impact areas. We are building a civil society advisory body. Entonces, en el segmento de microfinanzas desarrollamos un pool de indicadores sociales. We're looking at projects that will deliver quite major land use change to um, provide climate change resilience through uh, improved front defenses. The experiences we gained from the Australian National Outlook Project in, in stakeholder engagement, I think will stay with us for um, a very long time. When so many people actually come together and say, this is the way we need to cooperate to do good, um, then we realize that the change is really possible. It's not to damage business is to make business better. More and more banks are getting this and are understanding that their long-term success is indeed understanding that society's success goes along with it. When every bank employee and every bank around the world understands how their decisions affect society, affect the environment, and makes their decisions accordingly, does their work accordingly, interacts with clients accordingly, that's the moment when we've succeeded. The number of banks that uh, became founding signatories of the Principles for Responsible Banking was way beyond our wildest expectations. Independently from each other, they had developed the same vision. They all wanted a banking system that was really in the service of society, that very clearly contributed to the goals for a sustainable future. You cannot have a healthy economy in a planet that is not healthy, in a society that is not healthy and is not happy. Banking is all about reputation. And people are understanding more and more the importance. We need to become drivers of the culture change that is going on. It's about building trust with our stakeholders, about building trust um, with society. We need to shift the whole sector from not just thinking about risk in terms of climate change, uh, but we need to think the whole, uh, rethink the whole sector to take responsibility for impact and to really own the challenges that society faces, particularly aligning themselves around the sustainable development goals. Hence that the financial sector has a really central role to play in achieving the necessary transition to a more sustainable economy. Um, I mean, there was no option not to be part of it. <laughs> Let's put it like this. It provides us with a common set of uh, principles, with a common language. We have to work together. This isn't divisive and about an institution making profit. We can't change what is going on as a single entity. So if we're working on similar topics and in similar lines of thinking, then indeed we can be this catalyst as a sector to change things. That alignment has really meant that we can accelerate the execution of our social, economic and environmental strategy. Be more focused, be more precise, and also to compare with other financial institutions around the world. Methodologies around climate risk, for example, 
such a, a great opportunity for us to learn, but also how can we contribute to banks that are earlier, at earlier phases of their um, program as well. It's another message to all of our stakeholders and our members and clients that we are more and more convinced and serious in the way we want to contribute to uh, uh, clean energy, climate change, and also build a stronger environment in our society. It gives them an enormous amount of pride. It makes them want to do business with us. It makes them want to potentially leave other banks that haven't adopted the principles. It's not just about going to work every day. Uh, it's going to work to really make a difference long term. Sorry about that, ladies and gentlemen. I wasn't aware that the video was about to finish. Now, to continue our conference, we have a special keynote speech from Mr. Adam Bonnet. Mr. Bonnet is the Executive Director for Monetary Policy Instruments and Foreign Reserve Management at the Central Bank of Hungary. Mr. Bonnet, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for having the presentation there. So, thanks again for uh, for getting the chance to to be here and talk about uh, sustainability and sustainability in the monetary policy. Uh, I think about a decade ago, uh, it would have been a kind of impossible, or or at least a big surprise, to to talk uh, on a sustainability summit as a central banker. But today it can happen, and I think more and more people understand uh, that uh, any of us, any industries, has their own role in uh, in uh, the transition of uh, of the economy towards a green economy. And uh, in the next few minutes, I would like to talk about uh, uh, the role of a central bank. Uh, in the morning, you have heard about uh, the supervisory side. Uh, from our deputy governor, so I will be uh, focusing more on, on monetary policy. Uh, although, uh, as you have seen, supervisory side is as important as mo monetary policy as well. And in this short video, you also heard about uh, uh, heard about the banking sector, the commercial banks, and their role in this in this change. Uh, so, uh, putting our place in this whole environment, I think, is very important as a central bank and uh, I think it probably it will be very interesting for the audience as well to, uh, to, to see what, what, we done, uh, what we are doing in Hungary and what central banks around the globe uh, uh, do uh, in this regard. So, which, uh, okay is working now. So I think it's uh, undisputable that uh, in the last few weeks, months, is the key event on, on sustainability was the conference of the parties. And uh, I don't want to make a decision uh, on the debate whether it was a success or a failure. Uh, well, what I have seen is that there's some agreement on, on certain different topics from uh, from curbing methane emission uh, to stop deforestation to uh, kind of decrease at least uh, the use of coal. And I think what, what was truly important to see those thousands uh, of people marching on the streets and protesting for stricter, uh, uh, stricter regulations, stricter steps, stricter decisions from, uh, from the highest decision makers. Uh, it supports the idea that more and more people are interested in this topic and more and more people see that everybody around the globe has to uh, move together. I think it's a, uh, it's a good sign uh, and it uh, probably, although uh, uh, the results were uh, ambiguous, but it is a good sign that uh, uh, there is a future and I think uh, what was also very clear from uh, from this event is that uh, 
what we need for uh, for reach uh, a big change uh, in transition is the tons of money and uh, uh, this is one part where where central banks can get into the picture so there are certain estimates about how big this sum of money is but what we see that uh, annually around 7 trillion US dollar should be spent on uh, infrastructure in, uh, investment in the next decades or so so it is a big sum of money and, and I think this is one part where we understand that uh, the banking sector as a whole and for sure in the heart of the financial system as a central bank we have a great role to push forward or to, to, to foster uh, this change and uh, uh, what uh, uh, what is important is our role is not just because we are in the heart of the financial system but we see that uh, uh, all uh, the climate change and the transition itself uh, can threaten uh, us as a central bank to reach our goals and uh, this is also a point where we can understand that central banks should be among the leaders uh, to, to foster the change. And, uh, let me just give you some, some, some brief examples of what I, I, I'm thinking of. Uh, so first, what we see, what we face all the time, that extreme we weather conditions are the kind of new normal. Uh, so floods, tornadoes are part of our everyday life, sometimes even in Europe, which is a big change. And it has a direct effect on our financial system as well, because it can destroy uh, the buildings, it can destroy vehicles. Uh, uh, if I, I use financial terms, it can destroy the collaterals, it can destroy uh, those assets which were insured. And at the end of the day, it means losses for the financial system. So keeping financial stability uh, as a central bank is one of the key goals and it threatened this goal. Uh, on the other side, transition, especially an abrupt transition can uh, uh, put in default certain businesses because of, because of the changing regulation or uh, because of the changing customer behavior. So it is also another part where there can be a direct effect of, of, uh, of climate change on the financial system. So what we see is that to achieve our main goals, the price stability. When we think of price stability, just, just think of the effect of a potential drought on, on agricultural products and, and then the prices of those products. So to keep uh, price stability, to keep financial stability, and to, uh, to reach economic goals, we need a smooth transition to our green economy. And I think the good news is that from the last decade, the central banks got a lot of experience in, uh, in broadening their responsibility. So until the global financial crisis, we had the chance to, uh, to step into certain different places, what we have never seen before as central banks. But now we have uh, uh, experience in, in managing market failures, in managing big, big market turbulences, in managing the creation of new markets. So as a central bank, uh, with those experience, I think uh, we have uh, several tools to be among the, uh, the most important fighters uh, uh, in, this, in, in this game. And uh, central banks around the globe, not all of them, but, but many central banks around the globe uh, made their first or second or more steps uh, in this regard. Uh, i give you just some uh, examples. So the People Bank of China, who is among the, uh, the biggest players in, uh, in greening the financial system, uh, uh, gives some, uh, uh, some favorable interest rate for those banks uh, which were assessed to be green, or on the other side, uh, banks must offer reduced uh, interest rate uh, for loans uh, to pollution control facilities or environmental protection for certain green goals. Uh, the Bank of England also got a new remit from the Treasury, uh, so uh, 
by this probably they will uh, soon they will turn their asset purchase program towards green uh, and also the Bank of Japan has some uh, new program uh, probably the, the, the latest one is uh, an initiative uh, uh, to fund the banks with a very cheap fund uh, if they land for, uh, for, for green goals. So I think these are good examples. There are many of them around the, uh, around the globe, but it uh, reflects that uh, the central banks started to do their job in this regard. And I think uh, the MMB is, uh, although a small pay player in the central bank community around the globe, but is among the most active ones. And I think the Central Bank of Hungary uh, can be a good example for other banks and for, uh, for other central banks and for the commercial bank uh, industry as well. And you have heard about the supervisor side, uh, so let's see the, the uh, monetary policy side. Uh, what our first step was is uh, uh, the creation of a de dedicated green bond portfolio. So two years ago, the Central Bank of Hungary decided on uh, making a, a green bond portfolio. And uh, I think it is a good example for other central banks and uh, uh, for commercial banks or asset managers as well, uh, that uh, as a central bank, we put real money uh, in the market to finance uh, green goals, uh, green companies. And if you uh, just try to translate uh, for some certain figures the results of this, uh, of this green board portfolio, we can see that uh, the CO2 emission avoidance corresponds to the carbon footprint of a Hungarian town of, 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 of uh, 10,000 people, which is huge, I think. And this was only our first step. Uh, after, after that, we took part uh, with our government bond purchase program in the first uh, green government bond issuance. So with, uh, uh, with uh, putting in our program uh, this green bond, we could also help uh, to be successful in this market. And I think in the future, it will be very important uh, on the government side as well to, to have uh, a green government bond uh, market as well. But probably the biggest step until now was that we got the environmental sustainability mandate uh, from the parliament uh, this May. And the importance of this step is that uh, the Central Bank of Hungary is the first in Europe which has a clear mandate in the Central Bank Act to, uh, to follow environmental sustainability goals. And after we got this mandate, after the decision of the Parliament, we have published our uh, green monetary policy strategy and also we announced two programs and from that time, we, uh, we already started both these programs. And we made a commitment to, uh, to publish our first TCFD report as well in the next year, which is also an important step. Uh, in our strategy, we made it clear that, uh, that uh, Hungary's sustainable convergence can only be achieved through a green transformation. So, Green transformation is key, and this green transformation can be reached only with the transformation of the financial system. And the Central Bank of Hungary should be the leader of this transformation uh, by showing an example for the banking sector and via its programs which directly help the banking sector uh, in this, in this uh, transition. So let's see what, what are our programs. Uh, we started to, uh, to, uh, to make our programs on the, film of, uh, on the field of housing market. Why we made this decision? Uh, I think all of you who are from Hungary and you, you see the stock of uh, um, uh, housing in Hungary, you can, uh, you can confirm that uh, 
uh, that the quality of, of housing is very low in Hungary. And about uh, one third of uh, energy consumption is made by households in Hungary. Uh, and the reason behind it is that probably only 2% or 2.5% of the Hungarian housing stock uh, has a good energy efficiency, uh, meaning uh, has, a, uh, has a BB level. So most of the Hungarian housing stock has a, has a very low energy efficiency. So this is why we thought that as a first step, uh, we should focus on, on this market and support the changing of this market. Especially since we see that the renewal, uh, uh, renewing of, uh, of the housing stock is very, very slow in Hungary. So around uh, 0.5, so half percent of the housing stock uh, is renewing uh, each year in Hungary. It means that we need 200 years for a full uh, renewance, uh, which is quite long. So for this reason, we started two programs, as I mentioned. The first is a green mortgage bond purchase program. Uh, we are in this program, we are buying uh, 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 green mortgage bonds. Uh, these mortgage bonds has, have, to, uh, uh, have to meet the international standards, so or, or the green bond principle or the climate bonds, uh, the CI, uh, CBI. So they have to have uh, international certificate, and from the start of August, we started to buy these green bonds, both on the primary and the secondary market. We have a very high limit in uh, uh, each series, which is 50%. So I think it is a, a very great support to, to have to start this market and to have an active market uh, in this regard. And the first result shows that this activity of the Central Bank uh, of Hungary uh, had already for the market, so about 120 billion uh, uh, green mortgage bonds were issued in the last four months, which is a good result after a third year. So, uh, yeah. The second program, probably it is the most common one because, because uh, uh, as uh, as citizens, as potential buyers of, of homes, uh, probably all of you uh, meet with, it, uh, with uh, the advertisement of this, is the uh, new phase of funding for growth scheme, which is the green uh, home program, where uh, for green homes, you can get a loan on a maximum 2.5% interest rate. Uh, uh, the requirement is to have uh, 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 with, a, with a high energy efficiency, so with a BB classification. Uh, it can be new or it can, uh, uh, you should construct it. And uh, you can have a maximum amount of 7 uh, million Hungarian forint, which is quite a good sum comparing to the Hungarian ma market. And also you can have for, it, uh, for 25 years fixed rate. So it's a very favorable rate and I think it can be a great motivation for uh, any of us to to go towards green if we would like to buy a new home. And uh, our hope and we believe that uh, it will help to change the, the housing market. It will have to speed up the renewals of, of, of the housing market. We also made some I would say smaller step uh, uh, from uh, from the everyday people's view, but uh, it can be very important for for a commercial bank because we changed our collateral framework. So uh, those collaterals uh, which are green can a much favorable haircut, and it also it supports both sides of the market. So it supports all, uh, both the buyer. Uh, and the issuer to uh, to turn to green because for uh, both of them uh, it it will worse because at the end it uh, it will be a better collateral uh, for example when they dealing with the central bank of Hungary and uh, finally 
I think uh, the uh, uh, I, I think it is also very important uh, and also an important part of the whole transition is to be as transparent as possible. Since we want to be an example for all the commercial banks and other central banks, transparency will be key. And this is why we decided on, on, on TCFD report, or publishing TCFD report, which will happen next year. And also it is good to, to do this work, because uh, who started this work already knows that it is, it is a tough work. We need many people. We put a lot of effort to, to it to be perfect, uh, to cover uh, our processes, to cover, cover our oper operation as good as possible. But uh, on one side, this transparency will help uh, to see us better for the others. And we also can learn for, from this work. We, we understand our working much better. We understand our processes much better from a green point of view, which is very important to find those places when we can uh, make some changes. I think what is the most important message uh, of, uh, of my talk and what is the most important message from this monetary policy view is that everybody and every industry, every player has their role, role in, tra uh, in this green transition. The Central Bank of Hungary started it, and I believe that with this good example, we will have an effect on all the other players, and everybody will find uh, those fields where they can be active. And together, uh, it, uh, it may succeed at the end. So thank you for the attention. Thank you very much for that presentation, Mr. Bonai. And now, our next keynote speaker is Elizabeth Maruma Brema, Executive Secretary of the Convention on Biological Diversity at the United Nations and co-chair of TNFD. Since December 2019, Ms. Brema has been the active, uh, acting secretary of the Convention on Biological Diversity Secretariat. Prior to that, she served as the director of the Law Division at the United Nations Environmental Program in Nairobi, Kenya. With over two decades of experience at the United Nations, Ms. Mrema brings to the position extensive experience in global environmental law and policymaking, implementation of environmental and sustainable development programs, and a deep knowledge of multilateral processes. Today, she will be joining us online. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Elizabeth Maruma Brema. Thank you, thank you very much for the invitation. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. And apologies that I could jo not join you in person. I've been requested to speak uh, what I call from climate change to biodiversity and the role of the financial sector. And at this point, sincere thanks to the Central Bank of Hungary for inviting me to speak on this important uh, agenda on green finance. And it was really gratifying to see what the Central Bank of Hungary is already doing with regards to green financing. The recent events clearly have also shown beyond climate change, biodiversity and more broadly nature, the two are now recognized as real changes, challenges for the financial sector. We are at a crucial, mo crucial moment for climate and biodiversity, both for our planet and for all of us. Our recently ended uh, first part of the Conference of the Parties on Biodiversity in October in China and the Climate COP26 in Glasgow, the two have demonstrated as never before that climate change 
and nature are interconnected and that we will not solve climate crisis without nature or biodiversity crisis without addressing climate change. They also made it very clear that, or a clear case for the social challenge of these crises and the imperative to ensure that people, local communities, indigenous peoples are equally part of the solution. They gave finance and business a clear message that they need to simultaneously shift to nature positive and net zero models. Healthy ecosystems are essential for ensuring the stability of our economies. Nature loss, climate and climate change represent significant risk to corporate and financial stability. It was mentioned several times during both these two conferences of the parties that the involvement of all actors besides government, including business, the public and private financial sectors across developed and emerging economies is fundamental. There is therefore an urgent momentum to see across all strands of the economy, including the financial institutions, to contribute to restoring and rebuilding nature. There is an urgent need to consider nature beyond climate in all decision-making process at governmental level, as well as business and finance levels. The role of central banks is therefore very important. Scientists, economists have made it clear in terms of deterioration of the health of our ecosystem being very serious. Species loss, land degradation, deforestation, ecosystems loss and fragmentation, evasive alien species, impacts of chemicals, climate change, all are undermining nature. In its 2020 Global Risk Report, the World Economic Forum ranked biodiversity loss and ecosystem collapse as one of the top five risks in the next 10 years. It actually estimated that more than half of the global GDP, $44 trillion, involve activities that are moderately or highly dependent on nature. These figures and many others show that the risks of inaction are immense. But they also show that the opportunities for action are just as important. And the central bank has already uh, demonstrated with clear examples. It is therefore indeed that action for nature positive transitions is already also indicated in the same report by the World Economic Forum could generate at least $10.1 trillion in annual business value and accruing over 395 million jobs by 2030. So these are important figures. So what is the role of the global policies? And here looking at both the biodiversity conference of the parties as well as the climate uh, conference of the parties, both uh, which took place a month and a few weeks ago. F a few months ago, we concluded our first biodiversity conference of the parties in China. In that conference, almost 100 ministers, high level representatives of the civil society, business, financial sector, and other stakeholders adopted a Kunming declaration whereby governments committed to negotiate an effective post-2020 global biodiversity framework intended to hold and reverse biodiversity loss, as well as they set a strong political direction to engage and put nature on a path to recovery by 2030. Many commitments were made by governments and stakeholders on conservation, restoration, 
and sustainable use of biodiversity. For instance, the government of China initiated the establishment of the Kunming Biodiversity Fund with an initial capital of $233 million, inviting other stakeholders and partners to join. The government of UK and France announced that their climate funds, part of their climate funds will be directed to biodiversity. In fact, France indicating clearly that 30% of the climate fund will go to biodiversity restoration. A commitment by a coalition of financial institutions with 12 trillion euros committed to protect and restore biodiversity through their activities and investments. So if we come back now to the climate conference of the parties, which also marked a significant shift in one critical aspect, and that is nature was part of the climate discussions at a greater scale than ever before in the climate negotiations. Even the final text of the Glasgow Climate Pact includes some nature related mentions. It acknowledged the importance of protecting, restoring and conserving nature and ecosystems in delivering world climate uh, ambition. Nature was also widely and deeply discussed at side events and panel discussions alongside the formal negotiations and various pledges and commitments and new initiatives on nature were launched. Especially, I will refer to two pledges on demonstration from both public and private sector. Furthermore, we saw financial institutions, for instance, with $130 trillion of assets commit to net zero under the Glasgow Financial Alliance for net zero. In both conferences of the parties, we saw political momentum and commitments as important steps moving forward. However, much remains to be done and to be followed with concrete actions on the ground to really make that difference. In April next year, we will have our second part of the Biodiversity Conference of the Parties, where the parties are expected to adopt an ambitious post-2020 global biodiversity framework, which will be our framework for the next decades. This time, we collectively need to improve strategies to mainstream biodiversity into all sectors of the economy across developed and emerging markets. Incentives and disincentives for finance with regards to biodiversity management need strategic and serious considerations. Disclosure of nature-related risks can only be a very important tool to convert systemic, operational, reputational, and other risks posed to biodiversity loss into financial terms and influence decision-making. At the same time, a common disclosure framework will support the alignment of financial flows to nature positive outcomes and with the, uh, the post 2020 global biodiversity framework. Few words on the task force on nature related financial disclosure, uh, also abbreviated as TNFD. TNFD will help financial sector to actually fill these gaps. And I am pleased to co-chair this TNFD together with my co-chair, David Craig, former CEO of Refinitiv and strategic advisor of the London Stock Exchange. The task force is a market-led initiative developed by the market for the market in collaboration with public development banks and other stakeholders and experts in the biodiversity field. The task force aims to provide or develop and provide a framework by 2023 for financial institutions 
and organizations to be able to report and act on evolving nature-related risks, and to be able to support a shift in the global financial flows away from nature-negative outcomes towards nature-positive outcomes. The task force on nature-related financial disclosure will actually or is building upon the structure and foundation of the task force on climate financial disclosure and harness the synergies to avoid any possible conflict or overlaps. But we hope over time, the two frameworks will be complementary to each other. We need better information to allow financial institutions and companies to incorporate nature-related risks and opportunities into the decision-making processes. The term nature-related risks is referring to the risks and opportunities to an organization posed by the linkages between the organization's activities and nature. In addition to short-term financial risks or what we call today material, and this also will include longer term risks represented by its impacts and dependencies on nature. This means that organization will need to disclose not just how nature may positively and negatively impact the organization's immediate financial performance, but also how the organization positively and negatively impact on nature, impacts nature. Currently, the task force is composed of 34 senior executives from the financial institutions, corporate bodies, and market service providers. It is supported by a secretariat and external experts currently working on definitions of nature-related risks, data availability, metrics, and targets, and standards. They are expected to provide a better framework by the end of the first quarter of 2022, that's next year. And then we'll develop pilots to test this better framework and enable its further development. The Task Force Alliance also includes a forum comprising of some central banks, which is a global and multidisciplinary consultative network of institutional supporters who share the vision and mission of the task force on nature related financial disclosure. Currently, we have about 250 members. And of course, anytime it integrates and continues to integrate more members. And I use this opportunity to welcome the central banks to also join us in this task force on nature related. So what's the role of the central banks and regulators in this regard? The engagement of central banks and regulators is critical. We know that climate change is increasingly recognized as generating systemic risk for countries' debt uh, portfolios and credit ratings. And the same is also happening in the biodiversity field. The role of the central banks is very important to better demonstrate. And here I welcome the work currently done by the network of for greening the financial sector on the links made between biodiversity and financial, uh, financial stability, as well as uh, recent research carried out by some central banks in Netherlands, France, UK, Brazil, and others. For instance, the French and central bank research has highlighted significant exposure, in fact, around 40% of financial institutions to companies with very high or high dependence on ecosystem services. So while climate awareness is now well relatively established in economic sectors and society, the same may not yet be completely true for biodiversity. But still, there is no reason, there is a reason to be optimistic. And indeed, we have seen over the last years uh, how the economic and financial sectors have started to mobilize 
and really taking steps. Several coalitions have emerged and some announcements in favor of nature beyond climate have been made. And all these developments are very encouraging and we need to be followed by now concrete actions on the ground. And this event uh, today led by the Central Bank of Hungary is a clearly an important step towards this work. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Bremer. There are two questions that we would like to ask you. At the global level, similarly to the climate-related conferences that we've recently seen in Paris and Glasgow, large-scale international negotiations are taking place. Now, what should be the role of the financial sector at the United Nations Biodiversity Conference of COP15? Indeed, it, was, it has been an excellent coincidence that uh, these negotiations have taken place almost back to back. So what's the role of the financial sector? Number one, we need the financial sector to be present so that as observers also make proposals to be able then to play a role in the implementation of all the decisions which will be taken under the biodiversity conference of the parties. For instance, we have finance for biodiversity foundation as a very consistent, I would say, observer in our processes, but we will welcome also others to be represented and work with the CBD community because the financial sector need to be heard. It doesn't mean governments know that all what the financial sector particularly recently has been doing. And these experiences, best practices needed to be shared. And more important, to be present means to also ensure that the post-2020 global biodiversity framework to be adopted uh, next year, which will be universal, a framework for all, not just governments, and therefore so that business financial sector can also contribute to its implementation through its uh, many actions and commitments. And of course, we need to see more commitments to implement this global biodiversity framework, and importantly so, now to define how to be able to implement them when it is adopted. So please, the presence is important as the development process continues. Thank you. Thank you, and our second question is, what is the link uh, between the two frameworks, or what is complementary between them, the global biodiversity framework and the framework developed by the TNFD? Thank you. First, these are two parallel processes, uh, although and not happening at the same scale. The global biodiversity framework is a global policy, while the uh, task Force on Nature-Related Financial Disclosure or the framework to be developed by the task force, this will be a mechanism for financial institutions, corporates, data providers, insurance providers to be able to assess and report on what they are doing, will be doing on nature-related risks. And that, by that, then how then they will implement the global biodiversity framework. So actually, uh, this financial, uh, nature-related financial disclosure framework will be a tool for the implementation uh, of the global biodiversity framework as the contribution of the financial institutions in its implementation. Of course, the two are being developed by uh, different organizations. Uh, I mentioned TNFD, which is developing the framework, is led by the market for the market, while the post-2020 is led, is a part-led process, therefore governments, UN member states. But I have the privilege then to link the two, being the executive secretary of the Global Biodiversity Convention and the co-chair of the task force developing the framework for fi nature financial disclosure. So we hope then uh, the task force 
will be able to consider the targets and goals being set up by the global biodiversity framework and the global biodiversity framework to be able to work with the task force to coordinate the development of particularly the indicators and targets for the two uh, tools or processes. Thank you. Minister Brema, thank you very much for your answers and also for your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now, ladies and gentlemen, to continue today's conference, we move on to the second session that will put the challenges of sustainability beyond climate change under a magnifying glass. Opening this session will be Radovan Jelasic. Mr. Jelasic is the president of the Hungarian Banking Association and has been the chairman and CEO of Erste Bank Hungary since June 2011. He is a recognized banker with a thorough knowledge of Central and Eastern Europe. He gained wide experience during his outstanding career with banks and financial authorities. From 2004 to 2010, he was governor of the National Bank of Serbia. Previously, he served as the bank's deputy governor for four years. As a central banker, he played an important role in consolidating the Serbian banking sector and insurance market and strengthening the regulatory and supervisory authorities. So, to commence the second session, I would I'd like to ask Mr. Jelasic to take the stage and deliver his presentation. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, kind words. I probably was thinking maybe you're talking about somebody else, but yes, it was about me, so thank you once more. Um, maybe just very shortly, I just want to start with uh, two concrete notes at the very beginning. First of all, I think that is very interesting what did happen during the last couple of months. I call that we moved from a uh, 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 carrot, we moved to a stick policy as far as uh, environment and, and Greece policies are concerned. Um, till 2021, it was nice, it was exciting, it was interesting to pursue different green policies, sustainability issues, etc. Um, and if we have done something good, we usually got some, some reliefs to some extent, but even that one was pretty limited, but it gave you a good feeling. And now, to tell you honestly, why 21, I think, for all of us is definitely a changing point. Does we see more and more sticks coming, meaning um, there will be punishment, not only publicly, but also when you go to capital markets, uh, uh, when you look to supervisors, when you look to investors, when you look to clients. I think this is one of the one of the major changes, um, and uh, and the second thing um, that uh, we are still have a lot of lot of still outstanding issues. How to do that? Uh, let me just give you a concrete example. As a member of the larger group of banks, you go to your headquarters, you look to these different statistics about who is to which extent green. And then you realize that, um, um, or do you have a feeling that maybe some things are measured differently? And only once you get there, you realize that things are measured very, very differently in different countries. Um, and so as the EU taxonomy is still not finished, uh, who is to which extent green basically depends on which mirror are you putting in front of different banks? Are you putting the local mirror? or are you using, so to say, a group standard mirror? So uh, um, Hungary, Romania, Czech Republic, Austria are differently green, depending if you are using the local mirror or if you are using, so to say, the, the plan but still not finalize the EU taxonomy because then somebody suddenly, even a completely green country, can look uh, pretty brown and also also uh, um, vice versa. One thing definitely, and just the last comment before I start, but we are very happy that uh, we see that uh, more and more investments we can finance um, not anymore based on uh, state grants and subsidies, but we can find but we can finance them very concrete demand from the clients 
who are ready to pay 10, 20, 30 percent more for green energy. Um, usually what happened in the previous time period, um, a lot of these prices, favorable prices, competitive prices were based exclusively based on state subsidies. Now we see more and more, let me just give you a concrete example of business parks, of different buildings, so to say, that's want to appear green, that's want to attract green investments. Um, there are companies who are ready to pay 10, 20, 30, even 40 percent more for green electricity. And of course, if we have such buyers, we have no problems to finance this immediately as a, um, as a commercial bank. Um, we are doing, of course, our um, own way, um, first of all, to uh, carbon uh, neutrality. Um, our plan is to fulfill that by um, 2023, um, not by greenwashing, not by buying some CO2, uh, um, so to say, uh, uh, um, uh, quotas, but uh, uh, by really implementing it. Um, it goes from energy efficiency to renewable energy, um, especially thanks to digitalization. We were able substantially to decrease lower paper usage, electric cars. Um, so I always split this to tell you honestly when we talk about uh, uh, sustainability, what can we do? And I think first of all, all of our institutions have to show our own example, what is going to be our contribution, um, and later on go over to our balance sheet. Um, and of course, we as an institution on a group level also committed ourselves to do a net zero portfolio emission by, uh, by, uh, by 2050. Also members of different international cooperation like many of the institutions and uh, um, one of our DNAs since uh, 1819 when the institution was established is provide prosperity for our clients and definitely we are adding to this one sustainability. Um, our balance sheet group wise is approximately um, 300 uh, billion euros um, out of that small loans to clients without financial institutions is roughly 170, 180. And to tell you honestly, we have spent months and months to try to analyze I mean, uh, um, what is the portfolio emission distribution of our loan portfolio? Again, um, we are still using, to a large extent, local mirrors coming from different countries. Um, um, we were able to do a pretty good job regarding corporate, um, regarding retail. Um, we finished for the time being only for, uh, for mortgage. Um, very, very interesting numbers throughout the different countries based on houses, apartments, uh, uh, again, uh, 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 older EU and, and newer EU. Um, just want to tell you that um, um, I have a feeling sometimes it's much nicer to talk about nice words. We have to make it green it, we have to make it beautiful, we have to make it nice and, and blue. Um, but when it that comes down to the number, um, depends on you to which extent you want to trust me, but it's a, it's, it's a very, very uh, 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 challenging and very tough word. Um, how you are going to measure it, um, how you are going to follow up. Um, let me just give you one very simple uh, 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 example. All the banks were uh, providing mortgage loans um, for decades in, in Hungary. Um, there is this uh, energy pass that uh, is mandatory in Hungary already for uh, more than a decade. Um, we know that uh, some banks were asking it from, uh, uh, it's actually a mandatory part of the every uh, um, um, sales and purchase agreement in Hungary, but nobody had that in his database because nobody ever thought, you know, we would really need to use that for something. Huh? And now there is a big challenge. I mean, I have to go back to our clients and add and ask, or even to go through the papers physically and try to find that energy pass, which is probably somewhere there in the documents. But we have never thought about, you know, putting a, 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 a small a, a blank a, a information there and later on to, to fill it up. So um, 
It's fun to tell you and uh, 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 inform you that a uh, lot of detailed work is still ahead of us. As you can see, and as I mentioned already, out of the 170, 180 billion, we were at least able to allocate what's the energy usage of approximately 140, so approximately something like 80, 85. Um, we are definitely ready um, to help our clients to overcome challenging through the transformation in both groups. We see our role on one hand to channel everything which is available, which is uh, um, provide some favors um, from the central bank, from the government, from the government, let it be local, let it come from the international financial in institutions. Definitely, um, we are also the ones who, by being used as an example, are also promoting stability and sustainability. And we definitely want to disseminate the knowledge, but um, let me move a little bit to the other side and then tell immediately that, um, there, have, that there are probably limits to which extent we as lenders can alone change the world. Yeah? So yes, we go, yes, we say, yes, we explain, and uh, definitely it's going to increase. But there is also the other side that is needed, um, meaning uh, um, in some cases a little bit more investment at the beginning, which will pay off over a time period, um, more sensitivity, sensitivity to uh, what are we talking about. Um, and also please don't forget one thing, that uh, if you look to the loan penetration compared to GDP, there's a huge difference between the different countries. Um, Germany, Austria, loan penetration goes, you know, in some cases even depending which categories you take, total or only loan to cor or, or corporate, goes to 70, 80, 90, 100 percent to GDP. So this basically shows you how much leverage banks through loans have over economy. Uh, and in some other countries, uh, less developed countries, it goes down to 30, 40 percent meaning that the leverage again against the debtor is substantially lower through financial institution than it is in, um, in um, uh, more maturing countries. My last page, um, ESG is not just about environment. Um, social factors are also on our agenda. Um, we as an institution are definitely promoting to a large extent also um, financial uh, literacy projects and also uh, social housing, um, especially the financial literacy is definitely um, very, very closely related to sustainability, but let's be frank, social housing as well. Um, you can especially see that in certain countries with the lower level of GDP, um, with which and, and the way how some of the houses are heated and who are the biggest polluters. So definitely we are going to run and promote our policies uh, within ESG also in social and governmental affairs as well. So all in all, um, I think uh, there is no need um, um, to spend too much time to explain bankers why is that's important. Um, I think there is a um, huge effort in front of us to make sure that everybody else understands. Uh, banks don't do that because they have nothing better to do, but because through the banking sector um, 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 there is a need to reach much wider area of clients. Um, we want to make sure that we have a supporting hand on the uh, lenders as well, both retail and corporate, and um, through that joint effort we can uh, achieve the goals uh, um, about sustainability and to make sure that we pass this planet at least as nice environment as we got into that one. Thank you once more for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Jelicic.
And ladies and gentlemen, our next presentation will be delivered by Jacob Tome, Managing Director at Two Degree Investing Initiative. Mr. Tome led the development of the first two degree Celsius scenario analysis tool for financial portfolios, which is now applied by more than 250 financial institutions worldwide. In addition, he leads the organization's partnerships with a number of financial supervisors and governments, including as academic advisor to the Bank of England from 2017 to 2018. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Mr. Jacob Tome. Thank you and hello everyone. What a pleasure to speak here today. Uh, uh, and especially following such illustrious speakers and such incredible initiatives as well from the Central Bank of Hungary. Uh, I see the translators in the back. Uh, also want to thank you for helping me convey my message today. Uh, and I'll try and speak slowly and clearly so you don't have too much of a hard job for the next couple of minutes. Um, as I was already introduced, uh, my name is Jacob Tome. I'm director at the Two Degrees Investing Initiative. Uh, we are a nonprofit think tank based in a number of uh, European cities and in the States that works at the intersection of finance, climate change, and long-term risk and sustainability issues. Uh, we've worked a lot on the development of metrics, but are also interested in the role of citizens and individuals in the sustainable finance journey, and of course in the understanding of risk and policy interventions to help drive actions moving forward. What I want to do in my presentation today is tell you a little bit about the opportunities that new data sources and new data sets have for our understanding of sustainability in financial markets and the type of applications that we have seen around these issues. Now, if you have been to a sustainable finance conference before, you know a common refrain is the lack of data, the challenge around how to actually measure, quantify, and track sustainability. I think the promise is here, however, that as we are looking forward in the next few years, that that refrain will transform dramatically, that we will see significantly better, more sophisticated data, and very soon we will be having the challenge of processing all this information because it comes too much for us just to process normally. And a big driver for that, we've actually already heard it today in the uh, academic presentation, is the role of satellites and new technology in order to be able to break down the traditional data sources of corporate disclosure to bring new insights into the perspective of data. What you see here is on Google Maps a tar sands operation in Canada. It allows you to track the activities, what's going on, and, and where, these, where these operations are headed. You can also start to see that moving forward. Here is a map of somewhere in the vicinity of 95 to 98 percent of global coal-fired power plants. That's obviously incredibly powerful, and you can see if you think about the climate challenge, and of course other challenges like pollution, what these types of data sets can allow you to do. Uh, crucially, uh, going a little faster as I recognize I'm a bit, bit behind time already due to my introductions. Crucially, these types of data sets are way more granular, more down, drilling down into corporate ownership trees, which is so important, especially in this region where there are such huge linkages in terms of various supply chains, subsidiary companies, uh, and companies that aren't necessarily headquartered here, but operate here as subsidiaries of other companies. So being able to not just look at the parent company, what you see here as the ownership tree of a large Western European utility, but maybe you're just lending to the subsidiary of that parent company. What are those activities? What are they investing and what are they doing? So that's what asset level data and these new data sets allow you to do, not just the parent, not just the group level, but really to understand these types of information sets. And of course, the other huge advantage is the theme of this session today is impact, is that you can start to disentangle the real changes that companies are driving versus the changes on paper. Here you have an example for a large uh, European utility called RWE. And we've been tracking the changes of their installed renewable power capacity over time. If you just take a corporate report, they will say they've increased their renewable power consistently. That's the high blue line on the right versus a smaller blue line on the left. But the majority of that, that's the orange bar, is actually them buying renewable power from other companies. That's not adding renewable power to the system. That is simply moving the deck chairs on the Titanic. And this type of data is so powerful in being able to illustrate and highlight that. Now, another key new area of innovation is not just asset-level data. We're talking here about large industrial assets like power plants, 
like car factories, but also in the area of SMEs, which is really the great new frontier of sustainable finance over the next years. And again, in particular in a country like Hungary and in this region, obviously such a huge backbone of the economy and of the banking sector activities. What we see here is uh, the European Union supporting projects like ones that I'm working on designed to develop data sets for SMEs. These data sets are going to be looking at using new technologies, or not so new anymore to some, like web scraping, natural language processing, to take all the things that an SME says about itself on the internet, on various digital platforms, and bring that into an image about what that SME delivers. We're obviously looking at traditional sources like Yellow Pages, social media, their websites, especially after the pandemic, where they talk about the products and services they sell, and you're actually able to bring together a picture for that SME. And what's more, this is also such a huge opportunity to bring what we so often focus on on the climate side together with other areas. What you see here, for example, is a, is a restaurant, right? So you might find that restaurant and say, well, what does this restaurant have to do with sustainability risk? Well, this particular restaurant happens to be the restaurant next to the largest coal mine in Central Europe. So that restaurant might have a limited carbon footprint, but its employees, its clients, its customers, are employees of a large coal mine that is significantly exposed to climate risk. And these type of geographic linkages are really able to be surfaced through this type of analysis. And it's, again, not just a climate issue here, but obviously there's also a huge social issue potentially underlying this data, right? What happens here to these communities as the transition evolves? And how can the financial sector identify financing needs early to help those industries, those communities transform on this sustainability journey? We think this will dramatically transform the quality of the types of data sets that we just heard from the colleague from ESTA, the ability to really map a portfolio and to map all its clients and design strategies on the back of that. So let me take the time that I've left to talk a little bit more about the type of applications that we're seeing with these new types of data sets. And I'd like to highlight three in particular. One of them is the rise of country-coordinated alignment and sustainability exercises. Uh, we've focused so much on mandatory disclosure as a key tool of the EU policy framework, of course, and we've heard already about the TCFD framework uh, at length. But what we're seeing now are these types of exercises where this data is scaled for voluntary assessments of the national financial sector. They've taken place in 16 jurisdictions now around the world, across almost all the major continents. And what they allow us to do is to really allow the financial institutions and the central bank or the government to get a snapshot of where the sector is in large. Um, if I, I can illustrate one example in Switzerland, uh, a close, almost neighbor here, of course. Uh, so in Switzerland ran one of these exercises. They had um, 180 financial institutions participate on a purely voluntary basis, which represents around 70 to 80% of the asset management pension insurance market. So really an incredible large uptake, even though there wasn't a mandatory disclosure framework behind it. Now, what's interesting is they all ran the analysis on the same data set. So unlike in typical processes where you have a reporting form that you fill out, then you get maybe a consultancy or somebody to help you fill that out. Everyone uses different data. Everyone uses different approaches. Here you had 100% comparable approaches. 4,000 portfolios analyzed, over a million individual securities as part of a fully automated process that was, and it would say in terms of the marginal transaction cost, uh, probably per portfolio somewhere in the vicinity of 50 to $80 per portfolio analyzed. So it's really something that is accessible to all countries in the developing world. And you can see on the map, we're not just here talking about rich Western European countries, but countries working with Latin America and other places that are able to run these types of exercises because of the extent to which they're automated. Now, my favorite feedback when I was involved in these projects was with one of the Swiss um, pension funds who had never really worked on this topic before, took up this exercise, participated in it, and said afterwards, I don't think this was very useful to me. I want to do something different. And obviously, my first reaction is, well, that's not good. We just did this project, and hopefully it's useful. But it, what it actually means is that project really drove thinking by that institution, what are their needs? These are not exercises for a one-size-fit-all, but a way to educate and build capacity so that you can get the feedback. Listen, what we're trying to achieve on our side is perhaps a little bit different. And so. 
Over two and a half thousand financial institutions around the world have participated in all these and what are effectively purely voluntary exercises. Quite a striking number, I would say. Uh, to put that number into context, here's a picture of a lot of balloons. There's over 2,000 balloons on this picture. So that's all the financial institutions around the world. And the reason I do that is, of course, for a little bit of jest, but also to illustrate the scale of applications that we're now seeing in the market. That's just a very, very large number of not individuals, but financial institutions around the world who are running these types of exercises. And that also leads me to my second point, which is the application, obviously, on risk metrics. And what I think is really interesting here is the innovation in the applications where risk analyses are not just in classic stress test paradigms, where today you have a risk, you have a three-year time horizon, and then you move on. These types of risk analytics are really pushing the boundary of creativity and innovation when it comes to climate and sustainability assessments. One of those examples you see here on the right-hand side is an analysis where we looked at the difference in the transition risk uh, for financial institutions per year of delayed transition. It's, I think, quite an interesting thing to not just think about the levels of risk, but how much does it cost extra per year to delay the transition. And I think that can be also very powerful for a central bank or government to understand. We often hear about the cost of the transition, but to really understand year per year for different sectors, the red is oil, the blue is power, the green should be auto, and the, uh, sorry, the red is auto, the blue is coal, the green is oil and gas, and the orange is power, shows you what the additional costs are of delaying the transition. So we've talked about two applications. We see sort of the sustainability application, coordinated country exercises on this data set that I talked about earlier. We see private sector initiatives on risk assessments in particular, really scaling across the globe. And then finally, I mentioned this at the beginning, an, an opportunity to engage the public. Um, the um, famous development economist Hao Jun Chang in Oxford talks about Hamlet without the Prince of Denmark. So the idea that Hamlet's Shakespeare story is about the Prince of Denmark and we forget that this is what it's about. We've, we really forget the extent to which we need to engage the public on sustainable finance. They're the ultimate asset owners, the ultimate beneficiaries, the depositors and banks. And they have expectations and objectives and targets that they want to see translated when they go into the supermarket and when they work with their money. And so that's why it's so important that these applications don't become self-referential and dialogues among sustainability experts, but can actually scale in a way that we engage the public. We launched a platform for that objective in Germany last year. It's called the Mein Vermögen platform or My Fair Money. We've had over 30,000 users in a year. Now that's not the same user base as Facebook or Twitter, but I think it's a pretty impressive number for one year and trying to engage the public on what can be, and I'm sure you all appreciate that from today's presentations, a very technical topic. So I hope with this illustration I was able to talk to you a little bit today about the opportunities of data that really will transform the way central banks, governments, and financial institutions analyze and assess sustainability and understand the effect that sustainability strategies have on real-world emissions reductions or real-world sustainability outcomes and the different applications we see in the market around these objectives. Now, if you haven't had enough, and because it's the Christmas season, I'll leave you this link. This is our uh, Two Degrees Investing Initiative Advent Calendar. Uh, that is live right now, so if you want to read a report today, you can go check out that link and, and treat yourself to a little bit of fun and festivities. And I look forward to the panel and continuing the conversation today. I want to reiterate my thanks to the uh, Central Bank for the opportunity to talk a little bit about our projects today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Thank you for your insights, Mr. Tome. And ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker is Mr. Andras Puskas, the deputy CEO of Budapest Bank, part of the Hungarian bank holding. Mr. Puskas has held the position of deputy CEO of Budapest Bank since 2018, managing risk management, operations, IT, and project management, and is also a member of the bank's board of directors. 
Prior to that, from 2014, he worked for Magyar Export Import Bank ZRT and Magyar Export Hitelbiztosító ZRT as Deputy Chief Operating Officer and as a member of the Board of Directors of both the bank and the insurance companies. So, ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome for Mr. András Puskás. So thank you very much, dear guests, ladies and gentlemen. It's my great honor to represent uh, the Hungarian Bank Holding at such as a prestigious international event. Thank you for the excellent uh, organization. Recently, many of our Hungarian and foreign guests have been able to hear about the bank merger process, which is, the, which is almost unique in Europe today. Three individually dominant market players will merge. As a result, the second largest Hungarian bank will be established by the spring of 2023. The process gives us the opportunity to develop and build our operation on a completely new high-end IT system. At the same time, our goal is to standardize the good practices and aspirations that have been successful in the past at the member banks. We are in the fortunate position that the credit institutions involved in the merger are performing outstandingly in multiply market segments. This means the Hungarian bank holding could take advantage of the synergies and become a market leader in certain areas. After the merger, the bank holding will serve more than 2.5 million customers. As our branch network is by far the largest in the country, approximately 850,000, therefore we can also fully serve the needs of rural areas. Our aggregated balance sheet will be the second largest on the market. There are several areas in which we place particular emphasis on serving the retail clients outside of Budapest, financing the Hungarian agricultural and food industry, and supporting the development of the Hungarian SME sector. We also have a great responsibility for Hungarian society. Uh, the third part of total population is living at countryside and little towns. The SME segment employs more than two million people. This is approximately the half of the total number of workers. At the least, the food supply is the most fundamental need for Hungarians. So we are focusing, therefore we are, you, you can see we are focusing on the most important areas of the Hungarian economy. We have also defined our strategy along these goals. We are building a bank that is both cost effective and offers competitive financial solutions, all without compromising the coverage and physical accessibility. We can achieve this by radically developing our digital competencies. This is essential for re reaching the younger generations as well. We decided that all profit which we, we will realize until 2025 we are going to invest in our evolution. With this, we believe in that we can reach our goals as soon as possible. Now I will say a few words about the fusion process. In two weeks, the General Assembly of the MKB Bank will decide on several strategic issues and operational tasks, which will have key importance in the forthcoming merger. Thereafter, as of 1st of January, the bank holdings leasing subsidiaries will continue to operate jointly under the Euro leasing brand, creating the largest Hungarian leasing company. By the end of March, MKB Bank and Budapest Bank will merge and the banks will continue to operate under the name of MKB Bank on a temporary basis. At the end of 2022, we will get the most point uh, where our customers can already enjoy the benefits, our, uh, of the benefits of our modern services created by our IT and technology revolution. Finally, in the spring of 2023, the Takare Group and the MKB Bank will merge together. 
This is when the new bank gains it, its full form. When designing the new bank strategy and future, we have to take into many aspects. We see both globally and domestically new social preferences, climate issues, and sustainability matters. Innovations in the financial markets are also supporting this new ecosystem. In the EU, 42% of the total assets under management are invested based on the ESG benchmarks. The new ecosystem is driven by state authorities, including lawmakers, central banks, and financial supervisors as well. Requirements of the EU legal framework, such as the reporting obligations required by the SFDR regulation and the EU taxonomy, and its general effects on financial institutions is a crucial aspect that needs to be closely monitored. In my opinion, the Hungarian Central Bank handles this topic in a forward-looking manner that is even remarkable on a global scale. Its operation has been supplemented with a sustainable mandate and through its recommendations, it already achieved great impact in the bank sector. In that field, the Green Guidance, the Green Preferential Capital Requirement Program, the Green Mortgage Bond Purchase Program, and the Green Home Program, or the promotion or, of domestic green bond issues, are very important elements. The emergence of a new ecosystem is well illustrated by the dynamic change in the market trends. As we could see on the graph, Credit and bond issuances for sustainability purposes have multiplied more than eight times globally during the past five years. New products have been introduced to the market. The green bonds issued with, within the Hungarian Central Bank's asset purchase programs has greatly contributed to the development of the market in Hungary. More than 260 billion Hungarian forints corporate green bonds have already been issued of the part of the program. This market, uh, this market development uh, was also supported by the fact that the Hungarian government also appeared in the green bond market as an insurer. Green financing has been important for the Hungarian bank holdings members' banks as well. So far, as they currently have more than 200 billion Hungarian forints green exposure in their portfolios. The central bank also has a significant role in the development of the green mortgage bond market. The Hungarian bank holding, therefore, has a strong foundation regarding sustainable operations. There are several programs and products available that serve environmental purposes. In addition, member banks have a sustainable culture with a very strong social footing, which is reflected in their annual CSR activities and emblematic campaigns, some of which you can see on the slide. But that doesn't mean that we are at the end of the road. Moreover, I would say we are just at the very beginning. By merging the ambitions, of the three banks into a single organizational structure, we will address ESG and sustainability issues with sufficient emphasis. The recently launched strategic work builds on the ambitions shaping the future of MBH in terms of sustainable operations, building on the enthusiasm and experience of the colleagues working here. Besides the good foundation, a strategic work has also started recently. The result of this work is the formulation, formulation of a clear strategic vision. This strategic vision is based on the social responsibility. The financial intermediation system must be at the forefront of this change, shaping the new sustainable economic ecosystem. As the second largest bank in Hungary, we have a special responsibility in this matter. Due to its market-leading nature, the MBH is able to achieve a significant impact 
especially in the local corporate segment. The MBH Sustainability Strategic Framework outlines two strategic goals. First, based on the MBH role as a financial institution and second, as a corporate group. The Partner in Sustainable Finance Strategic Goal aims the, to create such an infrastructure, products and services for retail and corporate customers, which will help them to achieve their own sustainability and climate targets. The strategic goals involves the following guidelines. Adopting products and services that promote sustainability. Examples are the Central Bank's Green Home Program. Second, financing that promotes sustainability. The MBH aims to be present on the market of the sustainable financial products, both as an insurer and a buyer. Third, to establish an ESG-based risk framework in which MBH aims to extend the, the process of identifying risks from climate change and environmental damage and to integrate sustainability and climate goals into the risk management practices. MBH as a responsible corporate group aims to adopt sustainability principles into its own operations. MBH it aims uh, to reduce its, car its carbon footprint. MBH will reduce its energy, energy consumption and promote digital banking through which we aim to achieve a radical reduction in our paper usage. As a social responsible bank, it is important to be a fair and supportive partner to our, our employees and customers. MBH will also put a great emphasis on awareness raising, training and philanthropy based on past success stories as well. To this end, for example, it will provide an ESG training for its employees and intends to ensure a healthy work environment, non-discrimination and equal opportunities. From the governance point of view, MBH continuously ensures that it operates in accordance with the principles of ethics, transparency, compliance and sustainability. Sustainability will be represented on a high level within MBH. That is my professional goal as well. We will create an ESG department to coordinate and monitor all efforts. Furthermore, MBH will publish and audit sustainability report prepared in accordance with the GRI international framework. In addition, MBH plans to sign the UN principle for responsible banking. We have ambitious plans and the implementation is supported by a dedicated team. Let me outline some of our targets. The next short-term step is to develop a detailed plan based on our strategic vision and goals, setting out precise KPIs and action plans for the upcoming years. We will create an ESG department, conduct an ESG education program for our employees. The MKB, MKB and the Takarik Mortgage Bank will publish their sustainability reports and we will assign the UN principles for responsible banking, as I mentioned. Meanwhile, we will work on our risk assessment framework and develop new products to our customers. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your presentation, Mr. Pushkash. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the final participant of this session, Mr. Paul Bodner, will be joining us online. Mr. Bodner is the Global Head of Sustainable Investing at BlackRock. His team drives BlackRock's leadership in sustainable investing through the development of cutting-edge climate and sustainability research and the integration of these insights through BlackRock's suite of investment solutions. He served at the State Department as U.S. lead negotiator for climate finance and led the design of numerous initiatives, including the Global Innovation Lab for Climate Finance 
and the US Africa Clean Energy Finance Initiative. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the conference online Mr. Paul Bodner. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Yonapot Kivanok. As Hungarian American, I'm very pleased to be here at this major international conference convened by the National Bank of Hungary. As mentioned, I lead sustainable investing at BlackRock, a global asset manager. We manage nine and a half trillion dollars as a fiduciary on behalf of our clients and ultimately retirees and other savers. Our purpose as a firm is to enable more and more people to experience financial well-being. Two years ago, we set out to make sustainability our new standard for investing. And we are well along that journey. We have a dedicated sustainable investing platform that has attracted $430 billion in investment from our clients. And we have e integrated ESG uh, risk management into our entire portfolio, just to give two examples. Now, why did BlackRock choose to place such a strong emphasis on sustainability? At heart, it's because we believe sustainability risk is investment risk. As sustainability and sustainable development rise to the top of the agenda due to a combination of scientific and economic imperatives and changing preferences in society, this creates material risk and opportunity for companies all across the economy and therefore for retirees whose savings depend on the successful navigation of these changes and risks by those who manage their savings. Now, as sustainability and ESG uh, have become both more complex and more important at the same time in recent years, I know these concepts can be confusing for many. Let me offer three lenses uh, through which to understand these related concepts rooted in the underlying goals uh, that investors have. So first, sustainable investing can mean the use of existing best practices for investing and adding on to those new non-financial information that helps you construct better portfolios. This is really the importance of ESG. It used to be the case that investors mainly or exclusively focused on financial information and financial statements when assessing where to invest, uh, what kind of companies to invest in, for example, in public markets. ESG information came along as extra financial information that can be useful in understanding companies and their likely future financial performance, their resilience to shocks, how well managed they are, how happy their employees are, how efficiently they use resources. This is information uh, about business practices, ESG data. And using that information in addition to financial information can be helpful to construct portfolios uh, of made up of companies whose business practices position them better to navigate sustainability risk. So it's no surprise that portfolios that are weighted towards ESG often outperform market benchmarks, particularly during downturns. However, it's important to note that uh, when it comes to ESG scores, these scores are designed to give you information about companies. They are not necessarily designed to give you information about the contribution that companies make to the sustainability of a society or the planet. So you saw, you know, the title of this session is ESG and impact, right? ESG information tells you about companies, helps you pick better companies. Impact is a different matter. And so the second lens is impact. Uh, uh, increasingly, investors are changing their preferences about what they want to see uh, in terms of outcomes from their portfolios. More and more investors are not just interested in financial outcomes. Of course, those continue to be paramount and the performance of financial portfolios continues to be uh, obviously the number one factor. But investors, particularly millennials, younger, younger savers say, you know what, companies 
have important roles in society. I want companies to generate other social goods besides profits. And I would like my portfolio to reflect that, those preferences. So I am interested in more than just financial outcomes. I am interested in other outcomes. I would like my portfolio to advance sustainability outcomes and impacts. And, uh, and so that is obviously increasingly common and accounts for a huge change in investor uh, in flows towards sustainable companies in recent years. Now, those preferences can be quite individual. They can vary by culture. They can vary by region. They can vary by group. Um, but they are real, and they, they, they need to be incorporated into investment uh, considerations for those investors, in our case, our clients, who choose to do that. So that's a function of preferences. Some would say values. This is about social impact, socially responsible investing. So that's a second, a second lens. Uh, Values-driven investing, which is sometimes called sustainable investing also. The third category uh, is uh, what I would put climate uh, risk into. So we say climate risk is investment risk, not necessarily because we think uh, it's related to ESG scores or related to values. We say climate risk is investment risk because we believe that climate risk will reshape the global economy in the decades to come, regardless of whether it is managed successfully or unsuccessfully. And what we mean by that, uh, and, and you'll see this applies beyond climate as well, is that if we know that if we do not manage climate risk successfully as a, as a society, as, a, as a, a collective action problem, then we will face mounting and unmanageable costs associated with the physical impacts of climate change that will disrupt economies, that will negatively impact GDP growth, productivity, jobs, health outcomes. So uh, simply put, climate change is bad for the economy on aggregate, and it is bad for our clients' portfolios on aggregate. And that is why we believe that successful management of climate risk is very important, and we take a view on net zero and the goal of getting to net zero by 2050. On the other hand, successful management of climate risk involves the total transformation of how we make and use energy, how we move people and goods, how we construct the built environment, how we do agriculture, et cetera. So it is also transformative and it is also material for uh, financial portfolios, not to mention the real economy. So as you can see, uh, when it comes to this kind of sustainability risk, uh, which applies to climate change, but we also think applies to biodiversity and uh, pollution, other environmental factors, this is not a matter of values or ideology. This is a matter of physics and economics. And so uh, our clients uh, are increasingly concerned about the impact that climate risk one way or the other, right? Transition risk, physical risk, I'm sure you, you've covered these concepts. How, how the various ways that this could turn out in terms of the speed of decarbonization, the amount of climate change and temperature increase we're going to end up with, how all of that will impact their portfolios. Um, so these are the three sort of lenses through which we, we look at sustainable investing. What is it, how can you pick better companies for your portfolio and think about sustainability risk at the company level, right? How, how does it affect a company that society is trying to grapple with these issues? Is a company resilient to uh, changes in its operating environment? Uh, is it moving with the times when it comes to the values of the customer base and the operating environment that it works in? That's one lens. Secondly, sustainable investing uh, defined as values-based uh, investing increasingly for millennials and others. And third, this more, I, I think, hard-headed uh, uh, sense of sustainable investing being driven by the, I would say, the long time horizon financial materiality considerations uh, that have to do with environmental issues that are a function of the way the global economy works today. 
um, creating externalities that ultimately in turn impose constraints potentially on economic growth and our, 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 uh, our goals um, as a society. So uh, I hope this has been a helpful orientation um, and I look forward to the panel discussion uh, in a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bodner, and uh, thank you to all our speakers. And yes, indeed, it is now time for our second uh, panel discussion today with the session to participants. And I'll just wait for our colleagues here. Oh, yes. Setting things up for us. And I would like to... Now, we have Mr. Bodner still online with us. That's very good. I'd like to invite the participants on stage. Uh, first off, Mr. Radovan Jelasic. Jacob Tome, Mr. Andash Pushkash, and last but not least, allow me to introduce the moderator of this panel discussion, Mr. Tibor Fayesh, Senior Advisor at the MMB Sustainable Finance Department. Mr. Fayesh, the floor is yours. Is it working? It's working. Well, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you very much for your participation. Um, it's great that you are here and um, um, your presentations was uh, it's a great, great pleasure to hear. Um, so basically, um, it's obviously a big, big thank you for the audience as well because it's uh, late in the day. It's been a long day, but this is the last section and you may well know that um, basically in the last a uh, few minutes of the football matches, the most goals are scored, so this could prove to be the most exciting part. Um, <clears throat> before uh, kicking off, uh, um, and everyone here has been introduced already, including myself, um, one thing I'd like to do before the first question is to make sure the underline um, the messages uh, explained by our um, <clears throat> Our Deputy Governor uh, Chaba Kondrac and Executive Director uh, Adam Bonai, that basically the Central Bank of Hungary has uh, strongly committed to support financial sus um, environmental sustainability uh, with all its available tools. And um, this is clear that we've made achievements uh, in the past few years. But listening to all the presentations, I think it's clear that still a lot needs to be done. Um, basically, uh, financial risks stemming from biodiversity loss, um, transition or net zero uh, plans for financial institutions, and the broader involvement of retail investors uh, in sustainable finance are all new frontiers with uh, challenges to face. And um, I think, uh, regulators and central banks uh, have an important role to play, but also private actors and market participants have their responsibilities. So with that, I would like to turn to um, Dr. Tome uh, with the first question. When the Two Degrees Investing Initiative website opens up, the first thing you see is aligning financial markets with climate goals. So this motto to me rhymes with uh, a recent statement by Frank Alderson, chair of the NGFS, and I quote here, only by introducing mandatory transition plans can banks' lofty intentions for the next 30 years be turned into concrete actions now. It would seem that the two of you are quite in an agreement. Um, I'd like to ask for your stance, whether my assessment was accurate, and also would you think that mandatory transition plans are the way forward? Yeah, thanks. Um, I think the interesting thing about the idea of transition plans is that every company has a plan to transition, except sometimes the plan is not to transition, right? And I think sometimes we have this idea that either you're doing something or you're not affected by the topic or somehow can exit this conversation and you disclose then you enter this conversation or this dialogue. And I think really what mandatory transition plans are saying is that your every implicit plan has to become an ex explicit plan, right? Uh, the fact that you're not investing in green technologies is a plan and that plan is one to not engage with the opportunities that around the transition. 
And so having mandatory plans means that we need to be explicit about that, there needs to be a conscious decision, and there can be accountability for market actors, uh, like some of the colleagues on the panel, uh, around whether those transition plans can be effective. Now I do think that we need to be very careful about making sure that those transition plans speak to some of the issues we've surfaced today. One of them is the time horizon of those transition plans, that we have meaningful short-term accountability, that we're not doing the equivalent of setting New Year's resolutions in 30 years uh, and in the interim saying we can keep smoking or not going to the gym or all the beautiful things that we do. That's the first thing. And I, I think the second thing is that those transition plans meaningfully distinguish between something that Paul said, which is the uh, risk management of your transition and the extent to which you seek to contribute to realizing that transition, so the real world impact. Um, I think a beautiful example for that is the Swedish pension fund AP2. Uh, if anybody wants to ever read a sustainability report, and uh, no offense to Paul and the great work from BlackRock and the others on the panel, this is the one to read because AP2 actually distinguishes how their portfolio changes and how the companies in their portfolio are changing. And I think if we can get those different pieces together, the short-term accountability and that reference to the real-world transformation of the companies, I think that's when we can have a very effective policies around uh, making sure transition plans change the market. All right. Thanks very much for your answer. For a second, we'll stay at the transition plans, especially the mandatory transition plans. And we've seen uh, um, Mr. Yelesic's presentation that there's the group has made uh, progress in measuring finance emissions. So that's basically the first step towards uh, getting a transition plan. Um, I'd like to ask you to express your views about potential mandatory transition plans. Uh, um, basically set by regulators, and would you think this is reasonable or realistic, specifically on these markets, especially in Hungary? Yeah. Um, the central bank in Hungary was definitely playing a pioneering role in being one of the first ones in the EU actually extending its mandate, so uh, now the central bank has four mandates um, regarding sustainability. Um, and a part of this exercise, um, we all got a, uh, so to say, a request uh, from the central bank. I think banks for sure, insurance companies as well, yes, so. Um, about uh, preparing a plan, um, how this whole transition will look like. Um, there was, I think, a lot of discussions with the central bank about that one. Um, it was very nice to see that it was more, I mean, there was much more emphasis on the process than on the concrete numbers. Of course, numbers were a part of that one as well. But uh, as you would uh, say in Hungary, this is the kaiho. This is the basis that will be used in the future to look up, you know, how the development uh, uh, will look like. Um, actually, starting today, even appointed a uh, uh, um, sustainability uh, um, uh, uh, officer, so uh, we had them of course here and there, but I mean now we also need to present vis-a-vis -vis the central bank, the supervisor, somebody who is in charge of that one, who is putting all of these efforts together, so basically the trip is right now starting. Uh, of course there is going to be a lot of changes, there's going to be a lot of color changes on this way as well, as I already mentioned. But um, um, definitely now we have a basis for action. Um, it has started and um, it is uh, going to be uh, quite a big challenge because let's be also frank, uh, no, none of us right now has a clear view how much will it cost, uh, um, where should we, so to say, uh, uh, end up at the end of the day because I mean uh, this is also a moving target. Uh, but we all know that there is no way out of that one, and we have to perform on that one. Great, thank you very much. <clears throat> Going on to a slightly different topic, um, um, the Budapest Bank has uh, made an ecological footprint assessment together with uh, the uh, Worldwide Fund for Nature, and this seems like an unlikely cooperation. Not today, but a couple of years ago, this would have been a very strange uh, um, collaboration. Um, this uh, assessment was 
kind of a unique achievement in the Hungarian market. And um, I'd like to ask you if you can share any insights how this uh, uh, collaboration had, uh, what, what kind of experience was it? And more broadly, what do you think about um, you know, creating bridges between the scientific community, civil society, and the financial institutions today when there is data needs that are basically required by financial institutions and only scientific community can possibly provide it. Yeah, thank you. Um, actually, with the joint work uh, with, the, with VVF, we was very impressed. And uh, I think all the participants was very impressed with the Budapest Bank uh, and uh, with the VVF uh, colleagues as well. It was a real pleasure to uh, experience the organization commitment to the nature con conservation. And um, with this cooperation of the independent um, experts, we analyzed our carbon footprint in 2019. And the spectrum of this overview was so wide, included our electricity consumption, fleet operation, employee meals, and waste treatment too. Um, after the survey, according to the result, we could start our green program, which contains sustainability commitments, uh, which we decided to decrease our uh, CO2 emission uh, with 25% uh, uh, less until 2025. So to this day, we, re we remain gratefully to the VVF to, for this cooperation, among other things, based on the positive experience of this co uh, cooperation, we would like to uh, follow this uh, within the Magyar and the Hungarian bank holding too. So we will, uh, we will get broader this uh, cooperation and uh, we, will, uh, we will see it uh, in, in longer term together. All right, thank you. So basically this is not the end of the journey, but in the middle of this journey. Very good, thank you very much. Um, we're gonna shift gears here and I'm uh, turning to Mr. Bodnar. Um, Allow me to be a provocative here. So BlackRock has made headlines with being openly committed to sustainability, um, using investor voting, uh, promoting thought leadership by engaging on public policy issues, and you yourself have decades of experience in climate policy. Some civil society groups consider BlackRock's involvement in uh, public policy issues as a conflict of interest. So how far do you think financial institutions should go in their efforts to fight climate change? That's a great question. So uh, expectations about the role of financial institutions in this story are growing. And actually, I would say that on balance, civil society organizations are calling on BlackRock to become uh, more, use its voice more and more in, in, in uh, speaking about these issues. Uh, at the uh, recent Glasgow uh, Conference of the Parties, uh, for the UN Climate uh, Convention, uh, the uh, uh, Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, or GFANS, was launched. This is a group of around 450 financial institutions that cross banks, asset managers, asset owners, insurers, and others. They represent about 130 trillion in assets. And the whole purpose of bringing these institutions together uh, under this umbrella, all of them have committed to net zero by 2050. And the reason the United Nations wanted to bring us together was so that we would collaborate across the investment chain, that we could speak with a single voice facing public policy. GFANS issued a uh, call to action to governments laying out what we believe are the most important things that uh, public policy needs to do in order to accelerate the transition to net zero. So uh, I, I think there's a general support uh, and even push uh, for, for a greater engagement by financial institutions as, um, as important actors in, and not passive actors in driving this transition. At the same time, right, uh, we have fiduciary responsibilities and we, we're trying to do two things at the same time here as are many other financial institutions. One is to be clear 
that we want to contribute to the successful management of sustainability risk at a global level, recognizing that it is a collective action problem in which we can all make a contribution, right? So that's what things like this Glasgow Financial Alliance are about. That's why it's important to understand a topic like decarbonization as requiring <clears throat> collaboration among financial institutions, companies in the real economy, and policymakers. At the same time, our specific responsibilities to our clients uh, require us to make investment decisions based on the world uh, as it is and uh, not just as it should be. So um, this is, this is the, the, the balance that we all need, need to strike. And as you said, we've been very active, including in our stewardship efforts, where we show up as a shareholder on behalf of our clients, as a large shareholder in many public companies. And we've been very vocal and clear with those companies that they need to demonstrate how they are planning for a net zero transition, how they're going to thrive and generate shareholder value through that transition, which requires them to be aware uh, of, of the risks, to gather the data, to make plans, to make capital plans that are in line with their, their stated targets and commitments, and, uh, and to move forward. So we have, th th these are the ways that I think financial institutions are engaged. Um, if anything, I would say that you're seeing in the last few years a little bit of uh, attention between uh, a focus on governments first as the ones that need to solve the climate problem, right? For I would say the first 25 years of this story, uh, this is a problem for governments, this is a problem for public policy. And now there's been a little bit of a swing across to the financial sector. You know, it's the financial sector's job to, to solve this problem. And of course, you know, the answer lies, as I said, in between, uh, in my view, in the triangle between companies that own the assets that do the emitting, uh, the financial institutions that are their capital providers, and public policy that provides the umbrella framework for what's uh, what, what we're trying to do in terms of attaining societal objectives. Thank you very much, Mr. Bodner, for uh, um, explaining this and clearing this up. It has been. Uh, um, quite many times on the headlines uh, uh, with the BlackRock's involvement. And I'd like to stay a little more on the topic of uh, the role of financial institutions. And uh, back to you, Mr. Pushkash, I have the, the question. Um, you already explained that um, the bank holding is going to be one of the largest Hungarian institutions with um, um, considerable size and a broad reach. Um, do you also plan to gain kind of a market leading position in the in the sustainability space. You've mentioned you have a strategy towards this. Um, and more generally, where do you see the role of financial institutions? Absolutely, I, I agree. Um, we, we, have a, we have a strong st strategy. We have published uh, in the March of 2022, uh, ESG strategy, and it will contain uh, uh, this 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 goal how can we how can we reach it the number one market position in in in, in ESG Hungary uh, as the second largest uh, Hungarian credit institute we have a great responsibility in financing of course and, and fight against the climate change in Hungary as well uh, the green financing has already been important for the bank holdings uh, member banks as they currently have more than uh, 200 uh, 200 billion Hungarian forints green exposure in, in their portfolios, loans and bonds together. Um, we will continue this work and so uh, we aim to contribute as uh, much as possible to a sustainable future. And uh, the strategy we have formulated states that uh, we must incorporate the ESG approach into our entire opera operation. Uh, which uh, will affect our operation as a bank and uh, as a company as well. However, uh, a financial institution can still make uh, the biggest impact through its portfolio and customers, and we are committed to moving uh, into the direction too. Thank you. Thank you. I, I can see uh, clearly there's uh, a lot of uh, financial institutions then in Hungary who aim to be the market leaders in the sustainability space. So this is 
this is a very good thing, uh, I think. Um, so with that, I'd like to raise another topic and uh, back to you, Dr. Tome. Um, as you mentioned in your presentation as well, uh, Two Degrees Investing Initiative recently launched its uh, retail investment platform, My Fair Money, um, with an aim that investors can uh, marry their uh, sustainability preferences with their investment decisions. This is an extremely valuable tool, and um, some, in, uh, some of the audience might have remembered that um, it was explained by Chaba Kondraj that the Central Bank of Hungary is also planning to introduce a, a similar tool in the Hungarian market later on. Um, but we've come to understand, obviously, that ESG ratings are, you know, um, not always trustworthy. Um, let's say oil giants can get a good ESG scores and investments can be graded very differently by different methodologies. So how did you tackle this issue? And also I would like to know more whether um, how the reception was of this tool. Um, I, I've seen that more than 30,000 people registered, which, it, which sounds great, but do you have any more insights to share on that? Sure, thanks. I think trustworthy is difficult because ESG ratings are subjective and so they're not a testament of truth but the viewpoint of an organization and so it's kind of like uh, how trustworthy is a book review almost, right? There are different perspectives and some people love Harry Potter and others hate it and so the same for ESG ratings. But obviously that makes it really hard for retail investors to navigate the space because they do expect these experts to be truth some sort of universal truth and a guidance for how to invest sustainably. Um, I think the way we've tried to approach that is rather than start with the aggregate, try and give retail investors the opportunity to first actually identify what they're trying to achieve. Because it's one thing to ask somebody on the street, hey, do you want to save the polar bears? Yeah, sure, why not? If there's some time, let's do it. It's another thing to actually ask, what do you care about? What are you trying to achieve? You know, when we launched this platform, we did a lot of interviews and focus groups. And we have, for example, um, religious uh, folks who don't want to invest in alcohol, right? And they don't want to save the planet from alcohol. They just don't want to invest in alcohol themselves. Or uh, people who are vegan who don't want to invest in animal testing. And then there are others who are quite happy to invest in a company if that means uh, using the shareholder rights. Paul talked about this, you know, voting and trying to save the planet. And so with this platform, we really want to give investors the space to say, look, let me try and find the product or the, the investment opportunity that is actually aligned with what I'm trying to achieve. Um, and that means there isn't sort of a ranking. Here's the most sustainable, number one, and then we have fund 7,212 is the least, and you'd go top to bottom. It really navigates that way, and I think that's been a very effective way to address this ratings issue as well, recognizing that sometimes you need simple people to just tell you where to go. Um, now, in terms of the feedback, well, I mean, it's obviously been great to get such sort of organic uptake that we're seeing now, you know, word of mouth, and this really seems to be a topic that's moving through society uh, as sustainability becomes more important as well, that people understand it's not just, like I said before, in the supermarket, but also in your investments. So that's really great to see. I think the two key challenges have actually been that a lot of investors come to our platform and say, our ESG rating, you know, in this one rating we look good and the other one looks bad and that's not, that's not good. We don't want our rating to be displayed this way and we don't want it to look this way. And I think we are afraid of showing customers that there are different ways to look at sustainability. And I think that's a real challenge. We need to, you know, be more bold in saying, look, there isn't necessarily one way to look at it and this data provider thinks you're great and this one isn't and that's Retail customers can figure this out, and they're smart people and know how to deal with that. I think the other huge, huge challenge is just that retail investors live in a different world than sustainability professionals. So it's very hard for a fund that is an ESG fund. There's one example in Switzerland there where the largest constituent is McDonald's, uh, the, the burger fast food chain. Now, anybody on the street would say, how can McDonald's be the biggest company in an ESG fund? Well, they have you know, all these policies around uh, recycling and tra -la -la and all these other things and they have a great governance officer and all the, all the rest of it. And so whatever your view on the company, by the way, is no offense to anybody who is um, who's into McDonald's, it's just 
there is this sort of world of sustainability and there is the world of common sense retail investors and there's a big gap. And that's really a huge challenge. Uh, in, in this example, and I'll just name one more, I know we're short on time, but this idea of divestment, right? So when retail investors see a fund that says it's X fossil fuels or X animal testing or a fund that has all companies in the fund have women on their board, they think that's what that means. The reality is all these divestment policies have thresholds. You know, if you have less than 10% coal mining, you're okay. And if you do animal testing for medical purposes, that's also okay. And this is really a huge reputational risk that's coming like an avalanche into the sustainable finance market over the next year is that what sustainability professionals for fiduciary reasons, for concentration risk reasons, for liquidity reasons have decided is an acceptable sustainability fund is very disconnected from what the man or woman on the street thinks is an acceptable sustainability fund. We see that on our platform all the time, and it's a huge amount of work to intermediate and, and sort of converge those two different worlds, and any type of platform is gonna see uh, a big struggle around that. But it's just so rewarding to see you know, investors saying, hey, we, uh, um, uh, we, get, we got this email from one investor that says, no, actually, we." Uh, we, we, do, we only have companies that have women on the board. And we said, yeah, but what about this company that doesn't have a woman on the board? Yeah, yeah, but this company, it will it someday have a woman on the board. And we said, okay, well, let's call me when the woman is on the board and we can <laughs> change the rating on the platform. And I think that's, that's so, such a big part. It sounds cheesy, but it's such a big part of this process. It's not to go and bash people over the head, but it's just to require people to reflect on it. And it illustrates a lot of truth and drives actually a lot of action at the end of the day. All right, thanks. Just a quick follow-up question. So this is available in a couple of countries now. Are you planning to you know, enlarge the scope? We'd love to. So it's available in English, French, and German, and anybody can access it, of course, for free. And there's, I think, depending on which language you choose, between four and 8,000 funds on the platform. Uh, but we really want to make this Europe-wide. The European Commission is supporting this project financially as well. Maybe even uh, go across the Atlantic with it over time. Because it is a non-commercial, non-competitive solution, right? We're not selling anything on this platform, but it's just a way to educate um, the market. And so hopefully uh, next time we're at this conference, if I should be so lucky to invite again, we'll have a Hungarian version um, as well. But I think you mentioned the training and capacity building, such a huge challenge. You know, All the frontline brokers and loan officers, and I'm sure you have this as well, they're not trained in sustainability. How can they move forward on this topic. And one of the things we try to do with this platform is also create tools that help frontline bank advisors, you know, navigate the space so that the customer and the bank advisor can sort of hold hands together on this journey rather than, uh, you know, dealing with this uh, capacity gap. And I think it's, we, we're not gonna get these strategies that we've heard about here on the panel today effective if we don't get them into the minds of the frontline loan officers who are doing the day-to-day -day decision making and, and that will be a huge amount of work and hopefully platforms are not just for the retail investors but also for the you know asset managers and the bank side to help drive that process. All right, thanks very much. Um, staying on the topic of retail investments, uh, there's one interesting st statistic from a 2020 research that basically only 2% of Hungarian retail investors have ESG investments. At the same time, almost 60% would be inclined to use them. Um, with um, Erste Group uh, joining the European Commission's Green Consumption Pledge, um, it committed to provide further ESG investments and better information for investors. Um, do you see uh, an opportunity on the Hungarian market specifically? I mean, definitely just, uh, Thomas just mentioned here, you know, um, uh, about saving the polar bear. Uh, in many cases, especially when it's about Euro investment, we say people, well, you can make uh, no money here, neither there, but at least you can save a polar bear if you uh, buy into some uh, responsible funds and the ESG funds. So uh, there is definitely a uh, growing demand. Um, that's one thing. Um, question is, of course, uh, what's the yield? Um, a lot of our investments, of course, are interested in, in local yields, uh, in Hungarian foreign. So uh, we don't, so to have products which can be offered in that range, um, especially attractive ones. So uh, 
I think once more it's availability of the products which is growing but I think it's it's still not enough especially not reaching our part of the world then second is definitely educating the the uh, the employees I mean you need two to tango you also need uh, employees who know exactly and trust me this is a completely different world uh, you need to have the language the abbreviations the slogans and it's, it's just something completely different because you have to give the feeling to the client that's when he goes home, he knows exactly what he has bought, yeah? <laughs> which is not an easy thing. Um, so it's up in making, it is coming. Um, I do hope there is going to be substantially more substance than form. I think we should not f fall to the formality only. And I can only assure you there is just so much landing that can be uh, uh, secured in that area. I think all the banks in Hungary are not enough, so uh, uh, I think instead of competing who will do a billion or more or less, uh, uh, there is a space for everybody, trust me. All right, thank you very much. Um, I'm set to report that I think we are already over time, so we're, this conversation is coming to an end. Uh, but as a final question, um, I'd like to involve the audience as well. Um, so basically in the, in the last a few weeks ago, uh, COP26 uh, concluded with kind of mi mixed results and um, a lot of speakers already uh, talked about it, but I'd like to get your opinion. So climate activist Greta Thunberg considered that the progress achieved, and let me quote here, blah, 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 uh, meaning it's really not action, but uh, more of talking. While UN Special Envoy for Climate Action and Finance, Mark Carney, responded in kind, saying it's not blah, 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 so the money is there for transition. I'd like to ask you with a show of hands to tell me whether you agree more with uh, Greta Thunberg or Mark Carney. So first, Greta Thunberg. All right, it's, okay, at first it was a minority, now it's a majority. All right, interesting, because uh, so far the speakers um, um, had, well, mixed, but I think more positive um, uh, feelings about that. So who is the, on, on the Mark Carney side of the scale? Very interesting. He's a former, right. he's a former governor of uh, Bank of Canada and Bank of England, so we have to support okay. him. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. You had to say that. I understand. Um, I didn't see if Mr. Bodnar raised the hand with Greta Thunberg or Mark Carney. Um, well, if you don't want to, uh, can you very Beautiful. shortly explain explain your your stance? Yeah. Uh, look, uh, unfortunately, I've been to eleven of these cops. <laughs> in various capacities. And I, I do think this one was different. I think a lot is happening in the world, including in the real economy, in the financial sector. Um, what is happening in negotiating rooms at the COP is perhaps no longer the leading edge of this conversation, right? And so the fact that people spent, uh, they pulled three all-nighters to, to figure out how to make the word coal appear in a COP decision for the first time, uh, you know, what does that tell you about these processes? They're, they're a lagging indicator rather than a leading indicator of what's going on. So I think she's right in that sense. On the other hand, I agree with Mark that uh, the evidence is very heartening when you see what's happening across sectors, across technology development. Uh, and, and so it's a balance of both. All right, thank you. So I can clearly see that uh, anytime I read upon it, it's mixed results. And anytime I talk to people, it's mixed results. So it's very interesting. Um, it has been a, a great discussion. Thank you very much um, uh, for sharing your insights uh, with us. Um, in any case, uh, challenging journey is ahead, obviously. And uh, I wish you all the perseverance and strength to make the hard but right decisions. Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen, for a very informative panel discussion. And ladies and gentlemen, this has brought our event today 
to an end, or almost to its end. Um, and I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you for your participation and your avid attention. We hope that this conference has offered valuable insights on uh, green finance and timely news of climate change challenges concerning the financial sector. We also trust that we can count on your participation once again uh, at our future events too. Please feel free to stay and continue your discussions and networking activities in an informal environment. And if you're visiting us from abroad, we wish you a very safe trip home. Thank you and goodbye.